this pageantry cloaks the British Constitution. But what's really at its heart? Have you ever heard of parts of it called MISC-7, OD, ODSA, Gen-29, MISC-94, or the LF? What do you think they are? In some ways, these organizations are more secret than MI5 or MI6, and there are many more of them. These mysterious initials are amongst any Prime Minister's most closely guarded secrets. These are the organizations who have really decided critical national issues over the last ten years. Issues like Russians, the problem is Britain, and us. Unlike Parliament, only the Queen has a right to know how the Cabinet actually does its work, even if she doesn't always ask. But the committee system is secret from everyone else, and that often includes government ministers. My Lords and members of the House of Commons. So cabinet committees are the big secret of prime ministerial power. That power's most vulnerable, but most critical, at the time of a general election. In the last two elections, the outgoing governments use such committees for unusual tactics, which, like details of the committees themselves, have no place in the textbooks that are supposed to teach us about the British Constitution. The way it's taught is a combination of two things, magic and probity. The British Constitution is taught as a secret garden because it's not written down, and yet it's something magnificent. Probity is always stressed because it's accountability first and foremost. Civil servants are accountable to ministers, ministers are accountable to Parliament, and above all, the Prime Minister is accountable twice a week in the House of Commons. This is why it is claimed always, and it's now a cliché, Watergate could not happen in this country. The reality is rather different. The reality is such that these neat lines of command break down routinely. Chris Price tried to get the last Labour government to open up its cabinet committees. All secret committees are set up on the Prime Minister's own authority. There are certain cabinet committees which uh, are what you might call run-of-the-mill cabinet committees, which, though not public, are almost semi-public. Even cabinet ministers don't necessarily know who's on what committee. Oh, no, you can sit in the cabinet and feel totally disfranchised. I remember one of Mrs. Thatcher's ministers saying to me, you're always banging on about open government, more open government. She doesn't believe in open government for us, let alone people like you. The last Labour government promised freedom of information laws to place the burden on the public authorities to justify withholding information. Freedom of information bill, those in favour. Thank you. Anybody against? But Labour's Prime Ministers weren't so keen to put that promise into practice. So Jim Callaghan set up a cabinet committee to look into official secrecy. I am absolutely certain that Jim Callaghan was prevaricating between 1974 and 1979 because I was told later that a secret cabinet committee had been set up in order to prevaricate. It's called Gen 29, which is cabinet office gobbledygook for the 29th ad hoc committee created since Mr. Callaghan became Prime Minister. And for him it was also a secret. Oh, totally, yes. And its membership. Oh, yes, absolutely. I and mean, again, with complete lack of self-irony, Labour ministers, progressive to the last man and woman, go along with this nonsense whereby these committees uh, do not exist. It's as if the decisions come out of the ether, as if they hear the voices like Joan of Arc. But Jim Callaghan certainly wasn't going to bring openness to the Cabinet Committee system. In fact, Gen 29's plan was really to toughen the Official Secrets Act. A bill to do this had already been written, but they'd never dared to publish it. Further proposals will be brought forward to achieve more open government. It remains my government's intention to replace Section 2 of the Official Secrets Act 1911 with a measure better suited to present-day conditions. What that really meant was that Mr. Callaghan wasn't going to legislate, of course, just air some proposals in order to delay the whole thing. He didn't like the idea of open government one little bit. But he was suddenly put on... ...pose. You know, it was uh, four subjunctives and two negatives. <laughs> when detailed discussions on the bill began, a Home Office minister, Brynmore John, tried to alter Freud's bill to conform with what Gen 29 had wanted all along. Well, he was obviously very well briefed, and there were a lot of amendments which, um, had he not been the minister, one would have called wrecking amendments. Um, what would you call them? Wrecking amendments. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
it was a fairly eviscerated official information bill that came out of committee. Um, most of the clauses had been tampered with, and um, instead of shall, we had might, and instead of will, we had um, where possible should attempt to, that sort of thing. Meanwhile, Labour's grip on power was being eroded. Dustmen and lorry drivers were out on long strikes. The start of 1979 was the so-called winter of discontent. The Lib Lab Pact, which had held Jim Callaghan securely in power, was beginning to fall apart. No uh, encouragement to pursue that line at all. He was against it that much. He was trying to do deals on devolution on one thing and another. And Mr. Callaghan was very flexible in wanting to hold on to power over his political career. But th on this, freedom of information, he had a very massive sticking point. Early in the year, Chris Price, with other MPs and Floyd's advisers, started negotiating with civil servants over details of the bill. But the government wasn't willing to give ground. They were trying to turn it round to strengthen secrecy instead. Wednesday, 28th of March, 1979. In just nine days, Floyd's bill had faced its critical report stage. But Labour ministers faced a vote of confidence at 10 o'clock that very night. Liberal MPs would be voting with the opposition and Labour would have no overall majority. One Labour MP was seriously ill, so the government would be in a minority of one and doomed. If one Labour MP had to be missing, perhaps an opposing MP could go missing too. All the participants in what happened next have never together told their stories until now. Everybody was changing their mind as defeat stared them in the face. On the day Labour was facing a vote of confidence and uh, the votes were being secretly added up and it looked as though Labour was losing by one, I was approached by the Chief Whip and told that if I could save the day by getting Clement Freud to miss his train from Liverpool, Clement Freud could have his bill passed into law. Liberal candidate David Alton was campaigning with Freud in a local by-election. Freud had... I said, who is it? And they said it was the Prime Minister's office. And most of the people in Littlewoods were enormously impressed with this. Um, and I went to the office as if the Prime Minister phones me a lot. And uh, then there was sort of talk about, um, is this a secure line? And is nobody listening? And so I told the man to go away. And it was Chris Price and I said, and he said, I'm speaking to you from number 10 Downing Street, and you can have your bill, provided you miss your train. Well, I told Clement Freud that I wasn't just speaking in my capacity as an MP, I was speaking because the Chief Whip had called me, I assumed that that was on the full authority of the Prime Minister, and all he had to do was to miss his train to London. He didn't have to do anything more than that, and if he wanted to make it look like an accident, he could do that. I was in Liverpool, the vote was at 10 o'clock, this was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I suppose uh, I was helped in this by um, this coming as a bolt from the blue. I mean, I had no, no idea that they were even thinking about this. He said he'd think about it. I think it was a great shock to him. I don't think he was used, as used to wheeling and dealing in government as some other MPs and politicians. And I think the problem was he was incredulous. He wasn't certain whether Labour would have delivered. And what was I going to get as an official information bill? Um, some other useless, loose piece of legislation which wouldn't have been what I was on about. There was I, I mean, the country waiting for a new government. And there was I, actually by a negative act of missing a train. Um, Floyd had two hours to decide. Would it be the deal with Callaghan and freedom of information for Britain? or no deal, take a risk, and wait to see what the future might have in store. I didn't know. I was sitting on the Labour benches hoping that Freud was still in Liverpool. And as people filed out of the lobbies, and there was no Freud, no Freud, no Freud, my heart rose. Uh, then right at the end, as the last people came out of the lobby, uh, I saw him and I felt, crikey, I've lost that one and we've probably lost Got the train, had dinner, um, was bullied into going to the House of Commons even earlier than would have done, appeared, voted against the government, and the government fell by one vote. How did you feel being for 
a few hours. The Manipulating. <laughs> How did you feel the gov fate of the government of Britain was in your hands alone? I, I felt a sort of moral indignation that I should be brought into this. It's really very odd that having um, covertly opposed my bill as they did, they should then, for the doubtful advantage of governing for a few more months, which is all they had anyway, um, offer to do something which they said they wouldn't do. Mr. Callaghan's furniture was soon being carted out of number 10 by the back door. Would the new tenant be willing to make cabinet decision taking more open to the public? Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. Mrs. Thatcher is marvellous on the liberty of the individual, except when it comes to the right to know. That is missing from her pantheon. She's an exceedingly authoritarian lady when it comes to confidentiality of government operations and government paper. She has syringed the collective nature, the collective marrow from cabinet and cabinet committee work into informal ad hoc groups which she can stack to get the result she desires. And Mrs Thatcher has also used the traditional method of setting up formal cabinet subcommittees. One of these was the replacement of the Polaris Strategic Nuclear Deterrent Force with something else. And this was put into a cabinet committee known as MISC-7, which in our language, normal language, is the seventh ad hoc committee Mrs. Thatcher created after becoming Prime Minister. MISC meaning? Miscellaneous. And was this committee a secret? Totally. The decision by the MISC-7 cabinet committee to replace Polaris with Trident was soon followed by permission to station U.S. cruise missiles in Britain. The two decisions provoked immediate protests. After years in the political wilderness, the campaign for nuclear disarmament now found themselves at the centre of the political stage. Opinion polls showed a majority in Britain were opposed to Trident and Cruz. The government's popularity slumped. At the same time, CND's membership blossomed. Conservative party managers feared the whole defence issue could lose them the next election unless they took urgent steps to turn the tide of public opinion. What happened next? A campaign against CND led to a remarkable catalogue of Whitehall improprieties. One group broke the law. Government and foreign money was channelled into other groups. And the government itself was accused of improperly involving civil servants in party politics. The campaign against unilateral disarmament operated at three levels. The government, the Conservative Party and sympathetic outside organisations. On the government side, the secret cabinet committee, MISC-7, led on to a special subcommittee called the Ministerial Group on Nuclear Weapons and Public Opinion. The subcommittee was chaired by Defence Minister Peter Blaker, backed up by junior ministers from the Home Office and Foreign Office. Defence advice, like the film Protect and Survive, had been a political disaster. Instead of reassuring people, it made them more worried about nuclear war. A 1980 civil defence exercise, Square Leg, had shown graphically how Britain would fare under nuclear attack. With 130 nuclear weapons used, not a lot had be left. So ministers like Peter Blaker and Home Office Civil Defence Minister Patrick Mayhew were worried about where the bombs might land in the next exercise due in 1982. So in Hard Rock, less than 50 bombs would fall in Britain. Most British and American military bases would be excluded from the hit list in case local residents became nervous about being in the firing line. As far as possible, bombs shouldn't be targeted on major cities, and if they were, they should miss. But this meant nuclear weapons would have to land in some unlikely places. Malig in the northwest of Scotland, a remote fishing village with a population of less than a thousand, and mountains in the middle of Wales with no population at all to worry about. But the new target map still wasn't quite what ministers wanted. So they asked civil servants to list the parliamentary constituency in which each bomb would land and decided it would be unwise for bombs to land on any marginal constituency. They'd have to retarget these bombs too. The Cairngorm Mountains now became a prime target as more bombs were moved away from populated areas. But with all these changes, the whole exercise was by now so unrealistic that it had to be cancelled by the Home Secretary who blamed opposition from nuclear-free local authorities. There's never been a national civil defence exercise since. That was the government's first contribution to the campaign to win public opinion away from the peace movement. 
At the same time, the Conservative Party set up a special committee of their own, the Campaign for Peace Through Freedom, chaired by MP Winston Churchill. Piers Woolley was a Tory party official who worked for the new committee. <coughs> well, at Winston Churchill's meetings, the uh, Campaign for Peace Through Freedom was an umbrella organisation set out to coordinate the activities of the British Atlantic Committee, uh, BAC, uh, the Coalition for Peace Through Security, the CPS. These two organisations, the British Atlantic Committee and the Coalition for Peace Parties, the government now decided to increase their funding of BAC to help the committee to get the message across to the public. But the message was now an all-out attack on CND. BAC's government grant was nearly trebled to £58,000. But as a registered charity, the committee wasn't supposed to get involved in political campaigning. Um, Ken Aldred, who was BAC's representative on the Winston Churchill Committee, um, had reported back uh, to BAC itself, the organisation, with Alan Lee Williams, uh, that they were sailing pretty close to the concept of charitable status by taking a political stand on nuclear disarmament. And after receiving complaints, the charity commissioner said yes, BAC had stepped over the line. Soon after that, the British Atlantic Committee pulled out of Winston Churchill's group when they heard about the unorthodox activities of one of the other groups represented the Coalition for Peace Through Security. The Coalition was anything but a respected all-party organisation. It was run by three Conservative parliamentary candidates and an American businessman. The Coalition specialised in trying to disrupt CND events. It was backed by a foreign right-wing pressure group, the Heritage Foundation of Washington. Letters exist showing that the Heritage Foundation provided at least $60,000 to support the coalition's noisy opposition to CND. Uh, these were the streetwise kids, if you like. Um, they were mainly involved with uh, heckling at public meetings. Uh, CND demonstrations, the coalition frequently flew provocative banners low over the crowds. During 1982, their pilot was convicted of illegal and dangerous low-flying at one CND festival. But that didn't stop them. Nor did the coalition confine its activities to Britain. Two of their activists went to the United States to disrupt a speaking tour by Bruce Kent, then CND's general secretary. Well, the standard, uh, the standard technique of uh, papering over advertisements for meetings so that... Uh, the, uh, as far as most people were concerned, the venue had then been changed. So that anyone interested in uh, listening to Bruce Kent would turn up at the wrong meeting hall. My experience generally with the coalition has been uh, one of, um, of outrage on my part. I mean, I just didn't know people behaved like this in, in public life. I mean, I think that uh, I can't imagine an organisation behaving in a more disgraceful way, in a, uh, a society more democratic than most. The coalition also produced leaflets, distributed for them by the Conservative Party, just part of a great volume of material flooding out from a variety of organisations. The biggest contribution of all came from the Ministry of Defence, which could draw on an annual information budget of £16 million. This was one of the Defence Ministry's more memorable contributions to the campaign, the British Bulldog facing up to a bullying bear. Um, the Prime Minister herself was very enthusiastic about it, um, even though she had uh, slight problems about what colour the bear was. But apart from that little problem, um, there was quite a lot of enthusiasm for the pamphlet. How did she show her enthusiasm? By banging the table and uh, repeating that uh, we've got to use that bear. Senior Defence Ministry civil servants were a little less keen. I think it was a bit more extrovert than the normal stuff that, uh, you know, comes out of uh, uh, government departments, which is pretty stodgy on the whole. Uh, and I think certainly that leaflet was viewed as sort of slightly way out. That's the Prime Minister set up a series of Conservative Party liaison committees to plan the party's election stand on critical issues. The meetings took place in the Cabinet Room of Number 10, but these were party political committees. The Secretariat consisted of Conservative Party officials, not civil servants. There's a long-established convention in Whitehall that civil servants should not be seen to participate in party political occasions. 
I think it would be very unusual for any civil servant to attend a gathering of that nature, which, by definition, must be a party political occasion. It became known that Ingham had had an active role in the Conservatives' Liaison Committee on Defence. Eyebrows were raised. And very properly in Whitehall, the old sweats, who really do believe in keeping the distinction between appointed officials or permanent civil servants and elected people who serve the transient government of the day. And this was regarded as anathema. At the start of 1983, Michael Heseltine had taken over at the Ministry of Defence. Observers reckoned there were two reasons for his appointment. One is to make it more efficient, and he's good at that, likes management, which is very rare for a minister. The other one was to thump CNDs, a very successful servant of leading CND officers. I, I was again shocked. I, mean, I just didn't realise that uh, people who look so respectable in public will behave in such ways if they want political power. I mean, Heseltine has never um, smears um, the council of CND. He gets it wrong because he implies that there are 26 members of our council. There are actually over 100 because of the regional delegations coming, so he doesn't even get the proportions right. I don't think anybody had any illusions about what the purposes of DS-19 were. So, in the two years preceding the 1983 election, an extraordinary number and range of organisations had set about the task of winning public opinion over to the government's cause. Bodies ranging from the wilder fringes, like the Coalition for Peace Through Security, to the Defence Ministry's own DS-19. Their campaign worked. It was supremely successful in making CND's membership, senior membership, the issue, rather than the issue of unilateral disarmament. No, the main purpose was to win the election, and that is why the nature of the campaign was information, disinformation, and on many occasions character assassination. I think any government at the end of a second term is paranoid. By this stage, even the most balanced Prime Minister thinks the world is again him or her. Um, so there could be um, an even greater emphasis on massaging the media and all the rest of it. After this year's party conferences, it became apparent that defence, once again, would be one of the issues at the heart of the next general election. I would, if necessary, fight and die. Fight and lay down my life for my country and what it stands for. I would die for my country, but I tell you... We had union in 40 years, and they would have got it without firing a shot. There's a new Conservative committee to campaign against Labour and Alliance defence policies. And just as before the last election, there's a new government film on the Conservative Party's defence policy. And the secret committees of 1987, we might officially hear about them. In if you're a cabinet minister and you have to put up with difficult backbenchers and far from deferential press, a public opinion that does never understand the virtue of your case, the one compensation is going home late at night and breaking open the fourth red box that your private office has provided and seeing something from the Defence and Overseas Policy Committee of the Cabinet with top secret on it that only you and 12 other people know. It's one of the great compensations for an otherwise unbearable life. It is odd, isn't it, how people have the street. Politicians in opposition are happy to proclaim their commitment to openness. But once in power, it's a quite different story. Then, so it seems, the less we know, the more they like it. And governments of every denomination have been only too ready to go along with Whitehall's obsession that those who run Britain should remain a secret society. It's more than 20 years since NATO planners decided that any future conflict could not be an all-or-nothing nuclear war over in a few hours. So the new NATO strategy has made the extensive use of civil resources vital to military mobilization. But Whitehall's opted not to discuss the implications. In secret, though, they've agreed dozens of plans for resources to be allocated to meet the U.S. requirement. 
absolutely critical. There is no question, but it is one of the major wartime tasks of the United Kingdom is to be ready to receive massive amounts of material and personnel and to move them efficiently into the combat zone. The U.S. Air Force itself, in official evacuation plans for U.S. bases in Britain, says... Here in England, we're in the front lines where the action is. The last time Britain was in the front lines was September 1939. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note. Shortly before war was declared, a secretly written Emergency Powers Act was suddenly produced by the government and rushed through Parliament. It gave the government authority to take over any resources it needed, conscript labour and imprison people it regarded as dangerous. There was no time for Parliament to scrutinise the terms of the new laws. That no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. A few months into the war, the new laws were found to be too severe, so Parliament quickly reduced the government's special powers. The new laws are only partly based on what happened last time. Well, it seems as though the, a lot of the basic provisions are obviously similar and, and draw on experience from the Second World War. But in many cases, they seem to go a lot further and envisage much more sweeping powers for the government, particularly in a time of, of real crisis, of going far beyond powers that were taken in, in the 1940s. Just as in the 40s, thousands of American troops would be coming to Britain, but much more quickly, needing more from us. Fifteen years ago, secret negotiations began on the Americans' requests. Total commitment. In other words, for every plan we made to reinforce and resupply, there had to be host facilities to receive the material, transship it, secure it, uh, protect it, so that it was expected that every host nation was going to meet all of those requirements fully and promptly. That sort of requirement can't be met without new legal powers. So at the Home Office, special official committees on home defence have recently been supervising the preparation of the new war laws. In the last six years or so, this government has embarked on a sort of major programme of, of re-jigging the whole process and has produced a whole series of new bills uh, with, with new powers and in different orders and so on, so that, that the whole system has been modernised and brought up to date. On the 15th of October 1983, this senior civil servant was given a special assignment in the Home Office. Last year, Peter Harvey finished writing regulations to implement the new emergency laws. But Parliament isn't allowed to know. When MP Archie Kirkwood asked about Mr Harvey's work, all the Home Secretary would say was that... I do not think it is helpful to discuss the contribution of individual officers. So we checked the Home Office's internal directory, which MPs aren't allowed to have. Mr. Harvey's there as a legal consultant performing special duties with F6 Division. That division's only legal job is war emergency legislation. Number 10 have been equally reticent. The Prime Minister's refused to admit that any draft emergency laws existed, let alone newly written bills. It will be for the Government and Parliament of the day to determine the content and introduction of any such measures. It is not a matter which Parliament need address now. But why should the government want to conceal the new laws from MPs? Well, I think they might be uh, somewhat surprised at the degree of power that the government proposes to take, even quite early on in a, in a crisis. Widespread anti-nuclear protests have made war planning a sensitive subject round Whitehall. But we've talked to officials who've seen the new bills. They're already printed and could go to Parliament tomorrow. Today, they're stamped secret. There's going to be three bills, the first one to be passed very early in a crisis. It includes controls on public order, selective arrest and internment. Members of some army units have already been trained to run internment camps. It did actually quite shock me to a, quite a large extent because I'd never ever realised uh, that that was the type of thing that the TA was going to be used for. One type of internment camp was to hold suspected saboteurs. An island on the south coast had quite another role. This was a different type of internment camp. It was more for a mass of people, not for individuals. What kind of British people were supposedly being picked up in this exercise? Obviously people such as pacifists, uh, politicos, etc. were major targets. They were people that would be 
singled out for special treatment. Were you under any doubt that this was a dry run for the internment of British civilians? Absolutely no doubt about it at all. That's what shocked me about it. A full list of designated essential service routes is posted outside your local authority headquarters. The first two new emergency powers bills provide for controls on transport and movement by the public at a time when many people could desperately be trying to move to areas they thought safer. The laws are intended to control not just panic, but dissent as well. We're trying to get across to relatives in Lincoln. Not this way, you're not. Essential service is only this road. You have to find another route, I'm afraid. Well, that's bloody ridiculous. You can't just stop people like that. Essential service routes include major trunk roads through almost every British city. The name's recently changed, and now it's just effective traffic management. The government may not close roads completely, but police are still told to keep refugees off. If that were you, I'd go home and sit tight. That's what they're advising people to do. Fred's is fiction, but plans to keep motorways free for priority military operations are fact. Much of the urban population would be penned in and forced to stay put, with little hope of escape. One important escape route from the city of Glasgow leads north to the banks of Loch Lomond. But there's something about these famous banks that make this an area affected by yet another aspect of the secret new laws. As I walk down a cold on a fine spring morning. It's a tourist high spot, but tourists don't expect to find what's hidden in the hills. Emergency powers, stage one. All the land you've seen would be designated as ground defence areas. The whole areas around military bases, airfields and so on would almost be put under military control in which they'd be able to clear areas in order to defend them and these could extend for some miles around the bases in which the people living in the area will effectively be under military control. If a house was in the way of a line of fire or something in defending the base then it would be pulled down. For the first time last year, the government admitted its plans for ground defence areas, GDAs. They would be... The area associated with the tactical plan for defending a base. Each vital installation has an individual GDA tailored to its needs and the local geography. But who'll take charge in these special areas? In a crisis, boundaries between police and military responsibilities could get a little blurred. Should they be controlled by civil police or soldiers? If so, British or American? Officially, British laws and British police are in sole charge at all times. They should normally enforce the emergency laws. That's called the primacy of the police. But would this concept really work? Obviously, the military are going to have sweeping powers to do more or less as they, as they want to do, and that's going to be seen as the main priority. And uh, peacetime legal constraints, I'm afraid, I think, are probably going to take second place. Although the Americans are subject to British law, um, they're actually tried by American courts, so uh, to some extent they are outside the British legal system. This convoy is carrying British nuclear weapons. But during protests at the American nuclear store at Greenham Common, 
A ring of British troops and police were used to keep American forces and British protesters apart. But in a real crisis, would protesters be handled so gently? I think it would be total uh, resistance, a total uh, demand on the British government that any interference be suppressed uh, immediately and, and completely. If there were such a resistance and the United Kingdom police could not cope? I'm sure that they would call upon the U.S. forces to assist in the maintenance of order and, and security around our military bases and in our logistic support facilities. I think if, in fact, that the protests got to the point of where there was actually insurrection or actual um, violence between the NATO military forces and uh, the local population, then clearly American military commanders have the authority to use deadly force in the protection of their military assets. I would have thought under these conditions uh, something approaching martial law would have to take place. and The police are certainly not equipped for that. How would a dispute as to the use of resources between U.S. military requirements and British civilian requirements be resolved in this extreme crisis really, situation? But the way they're always resolved, actually, I mean, the, the civilian requirements would come second. I think that's obviously... Uh, always? Well, it did last time. I don't, I don't see why this should change. <laughs> English lakes were one of the venues for a mock mobilization exercise five months ago. The exercise tested the emergency laws for the first time. Thousands of refugees fled from Liverpool to the lakes, tramping for miles in the hope of finding food and shelter in Cumbria. But with the Lakeland tourist industry closed down for winter, there wouldn't be food reserves to support hordes of unwelcome incomers, and that had caused public order problems, to say the least. Thousands of U.S. troops poured into Manchester Airport and Liverpool docks. These became enemy targets and were heavily bombed. So the exercise anticipated that stage two of emergency powers had been reached. Civilian planes, like shipping and surface transport, would all be directed from a secret national coordination centre. During the exercise, a special government regional emergency committee was set up in this government office block in Manchester. For two days in November, this was a mini white hall ruling the whole of northwestern England. The exercise was only on paper, but there's nothing fictional about the scale of U.S. reinforcements. Something in the order of uh, 75,000 uh, troops uh, moving in the first few days of a combat uh, situation in Europe. And how many coming later? Uh, as we mobilize the reserves, uh, we're talking about another uh, two, three, four hundred thousand. Well, I think if most of the British troops go to Europe is currently planned, there would actually be more American troops in, in Britain than, than British troops. It would, uh, we all assume, uh, consist of American reinforcements moving in, uh, certainly by air, uh, clearly possibly by sea. It was the second thing, uh, and one's got to assume a, a cataclysmic situation in Europe, would of course be Soviet counteraction. They're not going just to let these chaps uh, roam around the place entirely unfettered and free. So we would uh, quite literally be the meat in the sandwich. In published information, the Home Office itself says that such military mobilization in Britain would cause major disruption to the life of the country. And this would lead to a situation of shortages of essential commodities and general national emergency. Getting troops to Europe and bringing refugees and casualties back is vital to reinforcement plans. Dozens of holiday ferries will be commandeered. Like other NATO shipping, they'll come under the control of a new international NATO Defence Shipping Authority. So the second stage of emergency powers gives the government authority to take control of every kind of transport. Roads, railways, air and seaports. Under a series of secret joint logistic plans, many of these resources are to be taken over on behalf of the Americans. The plans are part of a secret agreement with the United States. The agreement's called the U.S.-U.K. Lines of Communication Arrangement, U.S.-U.K. L.O.C. in military jargon. It was signed in London in 1973. Britain agreed to provide the U.S. Armed Forces with supplies and services, including fuel and food. The plans cover everything that the U.S. military can't conveniently bring with them. What's needed will, under emergency powers, 
have to be handed over by the civilian community. We were looking for everything that was necessary to receive the material, ports, uh, warehouses, supply depots, magazines, airfields, and then the ability to identify the material, assemble it into shipments, and to move it on into the battle zone. But the arrangement was secret from Parliament for 13 years, until disclosures two years ago. Then, for the first time, the 1986 annual defence white paper gave details of the arrangement. It's part of a new NATO concept called host nation support. The list includes petrol and oil stockpiles, garages, parts and fuel, cars, buses and trucks. They're all part of what Britain has agreed to provide for US-UK lines of communication, or LOC. Rationing schemes will be introduced to control civilian use of food and important commodities. Petrol and oil wouldn't just be rationed. The plans reserve all supplies for government and military use. The plans also cover conscript labor, Thousands of people with many different skills would be needed. You understand that it includes not only government support in the form of police and fire and border patrol and, and customs, etc., but it includes a wide variety of civilian support. The assumption is that the civilian population is going to be available and ready to support primarily a military operation. These are some of the skills listed and required. You may have a very good job in London uh, working at the stock exchange or, or uh, at, uh, what's the big department store, uh, Harrods, uh, and suddenly find yourself in a work battalion assigned to the docks or assigned to an airport as a cargo handler. There's going to be requisition of labor uh, probably as early as reinforced alert and certainly uniformly applied in general alert or conditions of war. The employment department's already made plans to identify those with the necessary skills. Kenneth Clark, Paymaster General, said, As part of the arrangement, the United Kingdom has agreed to take steps to try to ensure that their requirements for civilian manpower support are met. Detailed planning and support of the arrangement is classified. Uh, I can imagine the political consequence of detailing the planning considerations for requisitioning labor in time of war. Uh, it, it's not a, a requirement that many of us want to think about in peacetime and would not accept, I believe, uh, peacefully or <laughs> quietly. Burtonwood U.S. Army Base near Warrington. Not just a warehouse, but the biggest warehouse in Britain, holding stocks to equip entire army divisions. Amongst the Burtonwood stockpile are two prefabricated, thousand-bed mobile hospitals for the U.S. Army. Inside acres of wooden crates are all the parts needed to assemble them. But to put the hospital kits together, Britain has to provide, according to official U.S. information, 182 railroad cars, 28 trailers, and 490 skilled workers. It'll be local people who'll be told to do that work. The mobile hospitals are part of a bigger plan to make Britain a U.S. medical base. In fighting in a theater, and the United States specializes in fighting in somebody else's theater, the object is to keep our people there as long as we can, to restore their health if they're injured, and to restore them to the combat forces as quickly as possible. This generates a tremendous pressure on the host nations to provide hospital beds, to provide treatment facilities. In the United Kingdom, we were looking for thousands and tens of thousands of hospital beds so that we could treat people in the, zone, in the uh, European theater and keep them there for the combat forces. As long as they're in the theater, as soon as they're well restored to duty, as we say, they go into combat. Stop Hill Hospital, Glasgow, part of the National Health Service. It's one of three hospitals in Scotland and about 30 in Britain covered in the secret US-UK medical plans. The hospitals concerned are important to local emergency plans for civilian casualties. But the NHS emergency planner for this area has never been told what had happened. He just had rumours. There is a certain amount of knowledge of, of that, yes. But uh, it's uh, in a very vague sort of uh, position as far as we're concerned. 
But Dr. Wilson hadn't even heard rumours that a second major hospital in his area was in the secret medical deal. Behind his back, the government also offered the United States the large Garth Naval General Hospital. Other hospitals would be provided by the Americans themselves. One of three such hospitals in Scotland is at Arbroath on the East Coast. The US Navy will build its own 1,500-bed reserve hospital there. This old Gloucestershire airfield now accommodates one of a network of such US military reserve hospitals. Although they store millions of pounds worth of medical and surgical equipment, they're not to be used in peacetime by either British or American patients. And in a crisis, patients in civilian hospitals would just be sent home. The effect on civilian uh, hospital care is this, that the big infirmaries would be basically dealing with military casualties and would not be dealing with civilian, uh, ordinary type of illnesses that they're normally dealing with at present time. All over the country, health service planners have been put in the same position. It's government policy not to tell them which of many large hospitals have been secretly earmarked to meet US requirements. But should healthcare planners not be told which of their hospitals are committed to US military casualties? I suppose we would, uh, yes, it would, it would uh, to some extent be helpful, yes. This is how Health Minister Ray Whitney explained the medical aspects of the US-UK arrangement to MPs last year. Plans will be incorporated in those for the National Health Service as a whole in time of crisis or war. That's Whitehall speak for saying that the individual parts of the health service its regional administrators are not being told. So all the details of the US-UK lines of communication arrangement are still secret from Parliament and even from those in government who need to know. The Secretary of State for Defence between 1974 and 1976, Roy Mason, told us that he was never informed about the agreement. His successor, Lord Mully, was aware that an arrangement had been made, but he wasn't told about plans to be based on it. That's all the more remarkable when it's noted that the parallel agreements with West Germany are public documents. This is the British-German host nation support agreement. The parallel US-German treaty reports exactly and publicly how nearly 93,000 German civilians will work in support of US forces. So outside Britain, the existence of host nation support plans has almost always been a matter of public record. Britain's almost unique in NATO in having kept its emergency laws secret. 14 out of 15 other NATO nations have debated such laws and put them on the statute book. We're very worried that the government haven't disclosed plans for the next round of emergency legislation which they may introduce because it is now that Parliament ought to be saying, well, is this really the best way of going about it? And it's now that we ought to be debating it because during the Second World War a lot of miscarriages of justice happen to a lot of innocent people. So it's now that Parliament needs to be looking at that legislation, deciding whether the safeguards are there, deciding whether it's necessary, or even if it should be tightened up. The bills exist in draft form already, and under pressure of time and so on, that's what's likely to be introduced, and Parliament's going to be under pressure to pass these bills rapidly, and the amount of discussion is going to be very limited, and so in effect, what's being decided now inside Whitehall is what is almost certainly going to happen. Do you think it's necessary to keep all aspects of war emergency legislation secret? I mean, the answer, if you say all aspects, I mean, the answer is no, because manifestly a, a lot of them are, are not secret. Uh, I mean, on the whole, in a democracy, um, we ought, I think, to try and carry the people along with us. Uh, our democracies depend upon the willingness of the informed citizen to support the plans and objectives of the leadership. Now, if the plans and objectives are not ones that the citizens will support, they ought to have the information to assess the situation and reach that judgment intelligently. Horse Guards Parade, London, is where one day this story might end. It's a magnet where tourists now happily gather by the score. But if we ever reached emergency power stage three, there'd be a much more solemn and serious gathering here. The final bill is passed, presumably just before a nuclear attack, uh, which gives the government virtually powers to run the country as it sees fit, virtually winding up everything as we know it. There would be special courts with powers to try people and indeed sentence them to death.
Until a nuclear attack is judged imminent, civil servants are all supposed to be at their desks in Whitehall offices a few yards away. Then a chosen few would be telephoned and told, Operation Chanticleer has begun. They then to pick up their papers and run here. A convoy of military buses and escorts will be ready to whisk them out of London. With the nucleus of cabinet ministers, they could be soon all that's left of national government if Britain is attacked. Then with London emptying and in disarray, and the government itself buried under the English countryside, no one really expects that Parliament will meet to pass the third pre-nuclear attack bill. It had just become law by executive decree. Come on, quick, get down! For most of Britain, there'd be nowhere to hide from a nuclear attack. In peacetime, people don't like to think about the ultimate demands of wartime. Uh, I'm sure that there's a conscious decision to avoid any public discussion of these implications of our war plans. And just let's keep it secret. Uh, just not bring it up. It's, we're not keeping a secret, we're just not disclosing it for public discussion. NATO AWACS early warning aircraft returning to base in Lincolnshire. It's been out over the North Sea, doing a job we can't do for ourselves. Since 1984, Britain's been quietly borrowing AWACS from our NATO allies because of our costly failure to produce our own airborne radar aircraft. That's not a secret, just something the Ministry of Defence would prefer wasn't discussed openly. This, of course, is the reason for the Ministry's embarrassment. Britain's Nimrod should have been in service three years ago. But at the end of last year, with almost a billion pounds already spent on it, the Nimrod project was abandoned. Nimrod's been a very public disaster for Britain's defence industry, but it's actually just the latest in a long line of similar radar disasters. Successive governments have hidden the fact that every major new radar system since 1945 has been a failure. Three separate billion pound projects have gone wrong in complete secrecy. And there's another critical radar system that electronically sorts out our aircraft from theirs. That's been useless for 25 years. Meanwhile, key roles are still played by elderly equipment. The Shackleton early warning aircraft, designed in the early 1940s. This Type 80 radar, designed 35 years ago and Bloodhound surface-to-air missiles, 30 years old. The Shackletons clearly are old and were due to be phased out uh, a few years back, but of course until we've got our own AEW capability, we shall uh, hang on to them. The Bloodhound, of course, is one of those systems that can go on for a very long time. 
uh, we, I suppose you're talking about an 18th century knife that's had four new blades and three new handles. I think it's perfectly fair to say that one would never have a perfect air defence system. But what you don't really want is to have a, a, an air defence system which is like a piece of Emmentaler cheese in which the holes are more important than, than the cheese, as it were. I think we've always had a rather romantic view of our radar capabilities being the inventors of it. And of course, the whole science of radar has moved enormously fast. And every time somebody's invented something, uh, somebody else has invented something better. Britain pioneered radar in the early years of the last war. To watch out for enemy raids, strange masts were positioned around the south and east coasts. The chain home system gave early warning of German bombers crossing to Britain. Clumps of the huge masts still survive today, put to different uses now but still dominating the coastline at some familiar and appropriate spots, like the White Cliffs of Dover. In 1949, just four years after the war, the Soviet Union became the third country to develop the A-bomb. In Britain, there was a sudden hectic panic to rearm, and to reconstruct radar defense stations, protecting them from atomic attack. It was realized they were very, very vulnerable to nuclear attack, and therefore the decision was made to put them all underground, dig big holes and shove them all underground. And that was basically part of the Rotor plan. The Rotor plan took five years to complete. Money was just poured into Britain's underground electronic Maginot line. Entrances to the subterranean radar stations were painstakingly disguised as farm bungalows, standing sentinel over tunnels deep into the earth. Nearly 80 new stations and 1,600 monitoring screens went below ground. The biggest bunkers of all accommodated the regional sector operation centres. Barnton Quarry is discreetly tucked into wooded suburbs near Edinburgh. It was once the sector operation centre for Scotland. Barnton Quarry is a Type R4, three-storey, underground bunker, one of four major centres like it in the rotor network. Constructing just one centre like this was likened in Parliament to the amount of work involved in building a major new London Underground Railway Station. But Barnton Quarry and its counterparts was to be of service to the Royal Air Force for scarcely three years. Far from the surface, these vast underground vaults came into operation during 1953. More than 50 rooms accommodated controllers, their plots, a communication centre. Huge plant rooms circulated air to remove radioactive fallout. But filter rooms like this were the Achilles heel of the rotor system. Information coming in was endlessly passed round and got to ground controllers far too late. You often got cases where the Chief controller at the GCI will be given a position for a raid and he'd look on his radar tube and there wasn't a thing in the sky at that position. I think basically what went wrong with Rotor, uh, which was, it was two things. I mean, it took a lot longer to get into operation and, of course, it was much more costly than was forecast. Uh, that was common of most systems in those days uh, and isn't unknown even in these <laughs> days. Even before Rota began, it was doomed. British intelligence had forecast the arrival of jet fighters. Soviet MiG-15s were soon in action in Korea. Old-fashioned radar was dead on its feet. Fast jet fighters could be on their way home by the time defending fighters were scrambled. But the first version of a dramatically new type of radar scanner was delivered in 1955. The new scanners had a long range and a clear and precise picture. Some of the sharper brains at the lower levels of the service, I hasten to add, realised that this was the answer. That here you had your early warning, you had your control capacity off the same tube, therefore, what was to stop you taking over the whole function of noting the presence of incoming hostile attackers, scrambling aircraft from a
airfield and taking them over yourself all on the same from the same radar picture without any intermediaries any filtering any SOC or anything at all and that was the key to it it all happened at one particular place a Bulma on the northeast coast of Northumberland one controller at RAF Bulma got permission to try and do the whole radar control job himself the results were dramatic top secret RAF plans from 1955 show what happened next the experiment succeeded other centers just weren't needed. So the rotor plan came to a quick, costly, and completely secret end. There had been about 75 stations in the original rotor network. Nearly 30 had closed by the start of 1958. By July that year, 16 more stations had closed. By December, only 15 stations remained, and the closures continued. By 1964, there were just five master radar stations left with two sentries at the extremities of Britain. So most rotor stations now stand desolate and derelict. Probing Russians could hardly fail to notice that 70 of 75 British radar stations had rapidly gone off the air. But the British public was left in its usual happy state of complete ignorance. The public was to hear nothing of rotor until 1961, and nothing thereafter. This officially inspired report described the rotor network as ultra sophisticated. But the rotor system had been taken apart three years before. There was now a new military factor, British nuclear weapons carried by V bombers and the few of the Battle of Britain would now be obsolete too. There'd be no point in defending Britain from the air because enough enemy missiles and aircraft could always get through. So all that nuclear deterrent plans needed from radar was a tripwire to say that an attack was coming. Then the nuclear retaliation force would be unleashed for the counter-attack on their cities and that'd be the end of everything. was of course the strategy of massive retaliation. It was designed to be able to give a sufficient warning to get our V-bombers off in time to make such a strike and that was all. Our fighter assets were very small and it wasn't meant to be uh, an air defense system that could sustain and operate over a long period against conventional attack. The nuclear tripwire meant that the next radar network required only three radar stations they'd feed all their information to a single national control center. This plan was codenamed Linesman. But no operators would work at the three remaining air defense stations. A network of post office relay towers would pipe their radar pictures to the national control center instead. The plan was that they'd then be analyzed entirely by computers. West Drayton was the Linesman control center. All the RAF's remaining radar operators were to work here, in an ugly checkered brown building codenamed L1, Linesman 1. But Linesman 1 had some remarkable vulnerabilities. All the data from the East Coast radar stations was gathered together at the post office tower in London and fed through underground telephone cables to West Drayton. The cables came down this West London street, but there was one major security flaw. The cables came underneath this post office manhole cover in Bayswater, where, as was later to be drawn to the attention of the Royal Air Force, they were positioned almost directly underneath the embassy of the Soviet Union, vulnerable either to a telephone tapping tunnel or a swift act of sabotage in time of crisis or war. There was, however, just one saving grace to this aspect of the linesman system for which the cable was critical. The system never worked, so there wasn't much to listen to. The new radar system would depend entirely on computers. Part of the Plessy company, which specialized in building telephone exchanges, was asked to design a new range of computers. These, the XL computers, were to be at the heart of the Linesman 1 control center. Secret Society has obtained computer specifications which enable us to describe for the first time what these Linesman computers were actually supposed to do. The documents reveal that the computers were built before anyone had any idea of how to write programs for them. A bit like building a car before you realized it might need wheels as well as an engine. 
Guy Cuny, an expert computer analyst, has studied the secret specification for the XL computers. I have no evidence that it ever actually was built as such. It looks to me as if it was very, very slow. I mean, incredibly slow. It had about enough memory that um, it could perhaps have run a reasonably successful traffic management scheme for a local borough, perhaps something like that. For four years, Mel Wallace was a member of the Plessy programming team that tried to get linesmen going. I didn't find the system to operate. It never did operate. So even the reliability could never be tested on lines? It, it was never proven to my knowledge. If you'd built the system, which parts of it never were built, you would have been very lucky, I think, to have it going for maybe 10 minutes a week. It's like a glorified uh, telephone exchange. There were 21 computers in the main computer house uh, attached to rows and rows of uh, storage cabinets. The linesman computer plans explain that many of the Excel computers were unable to talk directly to each other. This they called a hardware mismatch, and if programmers didn't deal with it in the right way, the result was, in their words, complete chaos. I seriously doubt that these computers could ever have worked seriously together as long as there was any sense of urgency involved. There were a couple of instances where specialists were brought in to try and beef up the teams that were on site. Uh, there were personnel from uh, the ballistic missile early warning system, which was at Filingdale's, that were brought down here to work on the system. What was the reaction of the people from these other radar centres when they came to West Drayton and saw what was going on? I think generally it was despair. It's hard to believe they had any serious concept of what they were trying to do when you look at the specification. The, the whole thing actually sounds to me very like an early Space Invaders type game. The complexity of what this is doing is comparable with what linesmen could have done. But linesmen had to do a very much more complex task. With a less capable computer. With a very much less capable computer, yes. Even if the computers and radar screens worked, there was another serious problem. The National Control Centre, computers, operators and all, were situated above ground. Just one conventional bomb could have destroyed the whole lot. If you put all your eggs in one basket, if somebody drops a brick on that basket, you've lost all your eggs and probably your basket as well. In other words, if you knock out the nerve centre, the body dies. But the linesman fiasco was a complete secret. Neither Parliament nor public learned how badly things were going wrong. I was concerned about the situation. It's a very expensive system. And uh, I went to Westminster and had a word with my MP about it. But there was no investigation. Through selective leaks to the press, what the public found out was, to say the very least, misleading. For example, this officially inspired 1969 report. Linesmen will be a refreshing change from the parade of costly flops. For once, a really successful project. The Ministry is satisfied that linesmen will do the job it was designed for, and more. Complete rubbish, and they knew it. This old government information film includes a unique glimpse of the XL computers themselves. But they're not working. The government was told that the project was so obsolete it could not cope with any air threat. It's quite clear that when people were moving into the modern computer age, uh, they were expecting perhaps rather more uh, than they were able to uh, actually achieve. Computers uh, were in vast buildings, in vast cabinets, valve technology, and not always as speedy uh, and as capable as we'd all hoped. Hearing this, a parliamentary select committee asked for a full report. They never got it. By 1975, all hope of using West Drayton as a control centre was abandoned, and the computers, which had never ever worked, went on the scrap heap. Only the re-equipped linesman radar stations on the east coast survived. The result is that in 1986, stations like Boomer are doing the job using the same system that they invented here in 1956. The plotting tables have long since gone and been replaced by computers, but the basic methods remain unaltered. Radar trackers try to identify any new blips that appear on their screens. They mark it as a target for others to follow. Once the radar's locked onto a trace, information goes into a computer display called RAP, the recognized air picture. RAP 
can then show what's coming and going in the skies around Britain and beyond. With information from other NATO stations, RAP operators can look at aircraft movements over Scandinavia and even parts of the Soviet Union. The Buckinghamshire countryside's at the heart of a new billion pound series of projects. A new UK radar system is to replace what's left from linesmen. An RAF air operations centre has been built four storeys deep on National Trust land next door. They're calling it improvements, but it's actually a total reconstruction of the radar network. The improved United Kingdom Air Defence Ground Environment, or IUCAT, which is our shorthand acronym, really sums up all those things which form part of our air defence structure that doesn't fly. UCAD is a very, very complex system, the United Kingdom Air Defence Ground Environment. Uh, a system probably more complex than has been devised anywhere else. It is, of course, a very ambitious programme. It's only just beginning to come uh, into service. We will start moving into the proper architecture next year, and we'll have to wait and see just exactly what we get. Is it running on time? It has slipped a little bit, uh, but now we're confident that it's coming in on time. The new UCAD system isn't on the scale of rotor, nor as centralised as linesmen, but it does involve 11 large underground controls. The UCAD system was due to be operational last year. Now it will be phased in from now until the 1990s, and that's a problem. Sitting on top of a hill at Bulmer, this frontline operations centre is like a crab out of its shell while it grows a new one. For more than five years, Boomer and other similar control centres have been housed in prefabricated buildings, protected from attack by a few inches of wood. They're very vulnerable. But until the old Rotor Underground bunker is open again, as a working part of UCAD, there's nowhere else for them to go. Like everything else, when one's in a state of transition, it's always very difficult. But uh, no, I don't have any great concern in that respect. I believe that the architecture, the command and control structure that we have today could cope with that situation. But of course, I'll be a lot happier when it is all underground, and, and that is, of course, well before the end of the decade. The time when Boomer's fighter controllers can come back down the hill and go in underground again has been held up by computer software problems. First, the contracting companies argued about which computer they would choose and then about which programming language. Finally, they found that some of the computers they'd received were incompatible with each other. Again, uh, you're highlighting, quite rightly, some of what I might call the inevitable problems that occur when you really are ambitious and try, in fact, to solve some very, very complex problems in an integrated way. But one of the most important parts of the system will be missing for some time to come. Nimrod failed because its computers didn't work properly. At first, the plane flew perfectly and everything worked until the radar was turned on. What went wrong was that soon after that, the computer got very, very confused as the number of targets increased. The most spectacular problem occurred when the radar looked down on Britain itself. Suddenly, the screen's swarming with activity. Hundreds of low, slow, unidentified targets are all over Britain. They're at zero feet, speed 60 to 90 miles an hour. To sort out articulated lorries from enemy helicopters and missiles, the contractors had to install yet another computer inside the already tightly packed Nimrod. After this had been done, late last year, Defence Secretary George Younger ordered the final deciding playoff between Nimrod and the American AWACS. Nimrod lost. All this time, the Ministry had been keeping quiet about the fact that Britain was getting regular use of NATO's AWACS. Britain had, after all, originally rejected AWACS in going for Nimrod. But the RAF isn't so shy about demonstrating the quality of what AWACS provides. This is the NATO Early Warning Aircraft Link position at Bulmer. Marked by a white cross, the AWACS is 200 miles away and 6 miles up over the North Sea. Its information relayed down clearly and precisely. So it's easy to see why the RAF wanted AWACS. 
even when UCAD and the British Early Warning Aircraft Force are in operation, the government's got to face another billion pound radar problem. This secondary radar scanner operates the identification of friend or foe, or IFF system. Like an old medieval watchkeeper, the IFF radar scanner electronically hails each passing aircraft, asking them if they be friend or foe. When a friendly aircraft is detected, a special IFF signal should be sent back automatically. Then a friendly identification code appears. But the IFF system is old, it's unreliable, and the Russians know exactly how it works. Not because of a spy in the Royal Air Force, but because Britain officially sold them the whole system in the 1960s. Nowadays, Aeroflot airliners carry IFF systems based on the IAF design. The first IFF system was actually devised during the Second World War. It hasn't improved a lot since. I think if I remember rightly, there was a little button down the left-hand side of the cockpit which uh, uh, had sort of white painted lines on saying IFF, and which we were supposed to press on, you know, uh, in the hope that sort of friendly ships or army wouldn't shoot at you, which was not always realised. Did it work? Not really, I think, uh, very well, but I suppose it gave you at least some psychological comfort. No. I don't think at the moment that there is any question but the fact uh, that IFF, um, if I use the word shambles, that would be too strong a word. But certainly, uh, our arrangements for IFF at the moment are far from valid. If there were to be a reason to get worried about it, we could start shooting down our own side's aircraft very quickly indeed because of these problems. In, as they say, the heat of the battle, that would certainly be a real possibility. Open records of the fact that in NATO exercises, so we tend to shoot down quite a large number of our own aircraft. Not shoot them down literally, but uh, they're recorded as losses. Incidentally, we're not the only ones with an identification problem. Uh, they also have one too. And of course, if they have many more aircraft than we do, then they have many more chances of shooting down their own airplanes than we do ours. The basic problems with IFF are, what do you do if an incoming aircraft is not shown as friendly? Do you launch a missile? It might actually be a friendly aircraft whose IFF isn't working. Or if it's shown as friendly, might it really be an enemy spoofing by sending your side signals? There's only seconds to decide. The whole of southern England would become a deadly missile engagement zone. Any aircraft entering the area may do so facing the risk of their own death and destruction. I mean, this is probably the most long-running technological operational saga of them all. Uh, again, I think you are up against a phenomenally difficult problem. As I understand the situation, we might easily now, we have an agreement on, in principle, it's a compromise agreement, as you might expect, there's nothing wrong with that within the Alliance. As I understand it, that could be implemented now within three years. But at the minute, it just doesn't work. But at the moment, it certainly doesn't work. The House of Commons have been told that a new NATO identification system will cost Britain at least hundreds of millions of pounds. That's after NATO manages to agree on a common standard. But meanwhile, confidence in the future of UCAD is still high. I believe that this architecture that we've laid down, which is flexible enough to cope with new systems being buttoned on and old ones being taken out in the future, with the new fighters we're getting, with the new tankers and, and everyone early warning and everything else, that we are going to have a very efficable uh, air defence system in this country for the next 20 or more years. Warsaw Pact systems, Soviet systems are somewhat decried for their crudity and uh, their lack of workmanship and uh, quite a number of things, but at least there are two important features about them. One, they're there, and two, they work. Does secrecy uh, help or hinder the effectiveness of these projects? Secrecy is designed, I suppose, to make sure that, uh, that they are what they are, secret, and will therefore come as some stunning surprise to a potential enemy. But if secrecy uh, is, it works against, um, against objective uh, judgment, and if it's used and employed, again, politically, to cover up colossal blunders, then of course it's, uh, it's its own worst enemy. Four major billion-pound radar defense projects that didn't work. Rotor, Linesman, Nimrod, 
and IFF. Every time the public and parliament were the last people to find out that things had gone so badly wrong. And now another billion pound radar system's under construction here. You catch. Those who are in the know say that this time things are working out fine. But even if they're right, the effectiveness of UCAD is undermined by the failure of Nimrod to provide airborne early warning and by an IFF system, which, it seems, might as well not be there. And one thing we can be sure of, were there to be one more costly disaster, we'd be the very last people to hear about it. begin a new series under the title Secret Society. In tonight's program, journalist Duncan Campbell investigates the growing number of computer data banks and the information they hold on virtually every household and family in Britain. The man whose identity we've had to conceal is a mole. He says he can get confidential personal information from police computers. That's against the law. But he has no idea that he's being secretly filmed while he talks to me in the car. I've told him that I'm a businessman wanting checks made on people's criminal records. And he'll do the checks for a fee. 50 pounds each. And uh, half for your mates. Good. His mates are policemen who will sell him information. I'd met the mall at a hotel following an advertising campaign he ran last year. He'd contacted private businessmen, offering them access to confidential official records. One person he approached was private investigator Gary Murray. He then um, discussed in some detail how he could obtain criminal record information and DHSS information. What kind of checks did he offer to do and what would they cost? CRO checks, um, CRO meaning Criminal Records Office, and uh, there was a general discussion on costs, and as I recall, he, he simply said it depends on the nature of the inquiry, but anything from £30, I believe, was the amount involved. Two, three, four. He'll be back in touch soon to pass on the results of his checks, and we'll be seeing how he gets on. If he's successful, it illustrates the threat to our privacy from the rapidly growing number of government data banks. Right. To the CRO immediately. And that should help sweeten him too. But it's not just central government that has established large data banks. Over the last five years, two commercial companies have set up far bigger data banks. The largest in Britain, in fact, far larger than those operated by the police or DHSS. These commercial data banks have information on virtually everybody in the country. I know that I'm on the computers because I've looked. You're probably on the computers too. And almost certainly, everyone around me here in this market town is on these commercial computers as well. It's market day in the Yorkshire town of Nairsborough. We wanted to demonstrate just how much information is held on these private data banks and to find out how people reacted. Inside the tourist information centre in the town square, we set up a computer inquiry system with a terminal and screen linked directly to two private data banks. And then we approached some unsuspecting shoppers. 
There was no shortage of volunteers, people naturally curious to know what the computer might reveal and willing to tell us their reactions. But what would the computer say? Neither we nor our volunteers knew the answer. And how you react to that? Okay, fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's number 12, St. Paul's Road. And it's come back with the name of a man who doesn't have your surname. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that the man's name known to you? Uh, yes, that's my husband. How do you feel? Anne Watson's normally known by her maiden name because of her work. I think that's absolutely disgusting. I mean, I, I don't see why you should have access to that kind of information. I mean, that in particular could be quite embarrassing, couldn't it? I mean, it's bad enough that we just get vast amounts of unsolicited mail, you know, by this, by that, and phone calls, phone calls, financial services, speaking as though they're personal phone calls. Now you can understand why. Our next volunteer was also faced with the name of the man she was living with. <laughs> yeah. You're Bridget Howard? Yeah. And uh, can I ask you who Mark Golding is? My boyfriend. And yeah. you're sharing a house together? Yeah, we just bought it, yeah. Um. Well, I mean, you're seeing you accept, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so it doesn't bother me because oh. I've known that that information is held for so long. The fact that it's on computer is not really any different from it being in print. Um. <laughs> That's amazing. I um, hope it doesn't tell you about my five years in, in Dartmoor or anything like that. Well, your first name's Walter, though you didn't tell me that, and no. you live with a woman called Edith That's Smith. That's true. How do you feel about oh. suddenly being presented well, with well, a... Well, I'm a bit disturbed, like, I suppose, like everyone else is. Yes. I? I do get a lot of uh, unsolicited mail. Yes. I mean, who doesn't? We interviewed 10 people. In every case, the computer produced information about them and a complete list of other adults in the household. Nine of the 10 objected strongly to the idea that personal information about them was so easily available and to complete strangers. In one case, the financial information was so embarrassing, we agreed not to identify the person. But every one of them complained about unsolicited mail and they were angry at this use of the voter's role. Uh, had I known that the voters' role would be used yes. like this, I would have uh, done something. I don't quite know what, but I would have made my feelings known. It's compulsory for all adults to fill in this form so they can be sure that they do get the chance to vote. But the form doesn't tell you that the information may be sold to and used by anyone else. These days, most local councils keep the electoral register on computer. The voters' roll can be used by election candidates or consulted in town halls and public libraries. It's a useful check on who's entitled to vote. But every council, except one, sells the information on the rolls without asking anyone's permission. The exception is the London Borough of Greenwich. We think it would be quite wrong to do so. When we get information for the electoral register, it's very clearly understood that we need it for that purpose and very clearly implied that it won't be used for any other purpose, so we think it would be quite immoral to sell it for, to commercial companies. The danger is that when people realise that the reason that they're getting a lot of unsolicited mail through their door is because their name has been picked up through the electoral register, they'll think twice about whether they want to register. Private companies buy the register for about a penny a name, but sell it for up to a pound. CCN systems of Nottingham are the biggest in this business. As well as the voters' role, they fed in postcodes, court judgments, and information on what people buy, even government census data. They use it to provide some controversial services, for example, mailing lists of single women. Another service is an autotrace computer which can track you down if you change address. And if you buy something a retailer thinks your neighbours would like, CCN offers to write and tell them. UAPT the United Association for the Protection of Trade run the other giant data bank. Like CCN, they'll sell information to private detectives, as well as high street stores. They specialize in credit checks through the computer network we used earlier, Infolink. 
CCN also offer the computerized debt collection system. From anywhere in the country, you can tell CCN's central computer that you're owed money and want it collected. But there's no check on the accuracy of this information. And it's quite possible to put in false data. The computer will automatically harass someone without a check as to whether the debt was true in the first place. That would be a quite unreasonable thing to do to anybody else. But I'm going to select option 10 on this menu and tell the computer that I owe one of their clients a large sum of money and I'll be waiting to see what happens. Three days later, the first threatening letter arrived. Court proceedings would, it said, be instituted without further notice unless I paid up within seven days. Now, as you saw, the debt was completely phony and no attempt was made to check up on it. Letters like that are just sent out automatically by the computer at CCN subsidiary, Guardian Business Information. In Knaresborough, we'd found most people objected strongly to all these uses of the voters' role. So for a more scientific test of public opinion, we asked the Gallup organization to find out what people thought. They asked first if people approved or disapproved of council selling complete electoral lists to commercial companies. Only 7% of the sample approved. 79%, almost 8 out of 10, disapproved. More than half the population strongly disapproved. Then we asked how people felt about the information being assembled into national computer data banks by CCN and UAPT. Close to 9 out of 10 people, 86%, disapproved or strongly disapproved, just as we'd found in Nairsborough. Asked if they thought the practice should be made illegal, 89% of those who disapproved said, yes, it should be illegal. Government computer records now begin the day a person's born. Well, what week do you think she was? As soon as the new baby arrives, whether at home or in hospital, the person attending delivery has to fill in a notification of birth form. In this hospital, the ward sister can feed the information about baby Carrie MacDonald and her parents directly into the hospital's own computer, and from there it'll be relayed to the local health authority. The main purpose of the notification of birth system is to ensure that Carrie and other babies like her come under the automatic supervision of the National Health Service. Procedures like immunization can be monitored, and that's clearly in the child's interest. But the system now contains a great deal of sensitive personal information about the parents as well. I think the greatest concern is many people do not realize that this information is actually put onto computer. A hospital administrator who increasingly will have access to more and more sensitive data on the patients within the hospital could come under some pressure to release that information to uh, official bodies outside of the health service, for example, the police. This has already happened in the past. We know it has because the British Medical Association has been upset about it happening, and I think it's more likely to happen in the future. Soon, Carrie MacDonald will have a record here at the central office of the Department of Health and Social Security. Their Newcastle Computer Centre is soon to be home to the most ambitious government computer project this century, the Central Index of the DHSS, a population register on virtually everyone. Anyone who's been in contact with the HSS will go onto the, will go onto the Departmental Central Index, be it a pensioner, be it a child, be it someone in employment working, be it someone who's unemployed getting supplementary benefit. Everyone will go on it. Does it leave anyone out? There may be a few exceptions, people like expatriates, but virtually everyone living in the country will be on that index. The Central Index isn't exactly an official secret. But then public discussion of the plan hasn't been encouraged either. Ten years ago, a government-appointed committee warned of the dangers of such a universal index. If other computer networks were linked in, that would be a considerable threat to privacy and perhaps to freedom. It shouldn't happen without a new law. But it has happened. The DHSS Central Index has been made the core of the Inland Revenue's huge new national computer system. The National Taxpayer Tracing System will be enormously powerful. It will find anyone within about, with, within a few seconds, from any one of 25,000 terminals in any one of 600 offices. The government's been testing another computer system without your knowledge, and this one's clever as well as fast. 
keep your eye on the Maroon Estate car. Someone else is watching too, and they want to find this car and its driver quickly. There's an electronic ambush up ahead. The computer scans the number plates. They're checked against the wanted list. Mostly it's innocent traffic, but when a wanted number comes up, the alarms will soon be going off, like now. That demonstration was arranged by a computer company, but Home Office scientists have twice secretly tested similar devices. After a second scanner was installed in the M1, the government was asked a direct question, but their answer to MP Michael Meacher was, to say the least, incomplete. I think it was misleading because Meacher was quite specific in what he wanted and it didn't refer to the previous device at all. The description quite clearly fitted the device which was already in working in uh, Bedfordshire. And in fact, the public were never told that they were the guinea pigs in the experiment. Holidaymakers too will soon be welcomed back to Britain by clever computers. Everyone landing or leaving has to go through immigration checks. Strictly speaking, immigration officers don't just check passports. They're supposed to look everyone up in a little blue book and tell other authorities of anyone listed as coming or going. The book's called the Suspect Index, and it holds about 18,000 names, many of them British subjects. But the system doesn't work, and everyone knows it doesn't work. Until three years ago, Jolly and Jenkins was an immigration officer at Dover. It's a complete impossibility to check off every British passenger who comes in through a port of, of, of any reasonable size. There are several million people passing through Dover each year alone. So who's in the Blue Book? <laughs> That's a rather strange one. There's uh, Vanessa Redgrave, the mm. actress, for example, um, the left-wing uh, former student activist Tarek Ali, uh, the ex-spy Kim Philby, just in case he should care to come back. Why doesn't the system work? Because there are simply too many people coming through the country, several million at this port alone each year. The technology rules it out right now. So at the minute, immigration officers don't bother at all to check passengers who've got British passports. There's just too many to do by hand. But not for much longer. Like the rest of the EEC, Britain plans to introduce machine-readable passports starting next year. These new-style passports are simply pushed into a special reader. But feeding all the information into a computer network wasn't how the Home Office first presented its plans to the public. The Home Office emphasised that the machine-readable passports would ease the queues at such places as at Gatwick and Heathrow. There was very little, if any, mention that it was uh, to be connected up to a suspect index in the early stages. Did you have any evidence that suggested that this wasn't the whole truth? Yes, um, I had come across a document which um, was an internal Home Office document written several years earlier, which quite clearly stated that the intention of machine readable passports was to um, use them as a basis for reading automatically people entering and leaving the country and to compare their names against a suspect index. This is the document and it could hardly be more explicit about the SI, the suspect index. One of the major benefits of an automated machine-readable passport system is the potential for performing automatic SI checks. An effective SI system can only be achieved through some form of automation. So it will increase the capacity of the index. More names will be entered onto the computer because the computer can store more information than in a book. So the prospects um, in terms of threats to privacy are concerned I think are quite bleak because uh, the problems aren't being addressed at the moment. Computers that can read passports, car number plates and even understand what's said to them perhaps don't seem too surprising anymore. But they are machines. They're fast and clever and relentless. And they don't know or care about your right to privacy. The government's own data protection committee foresaw these dangers 
but the warnings fell on deaf ears. Apart from one or two rather uh, disparaging remarks by a duly minister of the Home Office, uh, the Carleton government didn't respond other than doing what all governments do on these occasions, send the report out to all those who've already contributed to it and ask people what they think of it. Why should they do that? I don't know. The cynics would say this is another way of uh, ensuring that time passes. Nevertheless, six years after Sir Norman reported, the Data Protection Act was finally passed by Parliament in 1984, an auspicious year. In the end, it wasn't a newfound concern for the individual's right to privacy that moved the government to act. It was economic necessity. It didn't really have any choice. There was a convention from the Council of Europe which required all the European states to implement such an act, and had we not done so, we would have suffered some trade damage, inasmuch as the, those countries with such an act would not have been allowed to trade on us in respect of computer information. At first, the Home Office suggested that the person who had to protect the public's right to privacy, the Data Protection Registrar, should be a government official from the Home Office itself. Experts were staggered by this idea. It hardly seemed to me to be, what, to be capable of being taken seriously. It was such a travesty of a proposal, and it did so miss the mark, most of the, the, the central point of uh, the importance of data protection as seemed to be part of the protection of the individual against the untrammeled uh, use of state power. Well, it's a home office that a lot of people who write to us are complaining about. Uh, so they would be arbiters in their own cause, which would be completely wrong. And what's more, they had never done anything which would give the average citizen any confidence that they had any interest in privacy and would enforce privacy laws, all they'd done all along the line for years and years, in reaction to many government reports, was to put it off and put it off, then suggest they did the bare minimum. In November this year, the Data Protection Act will be in full effect, allowing people a limited right to see what's held about them. The Home Office were eventually persuaded to make the Data Protection Registrar independent. So the register's been set up in Manchester, not in Whitehall. Eric Howes a staff of almost 50 to help him keep the register up to date. I have a number of tasks, I wear a number of hats if you like, but really key act key, key things that I have to do are the ombudsman role. I think this is vitally important, being there as a person who can accept complaints from the public, investigate them, get them sorted out. He and his staff have had a busy time registering particulars of hundreds of thousands of computer data banks and their users into another data bank. He's the public watchdog, but a watchdog needs teeth to stop abuses. We were unhappy about the rather um, inactive role that could be attributed to the registrar in the, um, from the Act. It's certainly better than the bill. The bill didn't give him anything to do at all. It just said he may do this and he may do that. One could imagine him sipping sherry on a Friday afternoon and decided that he wouldn't bother. So what's to stop someone registering to say, well, I'll do anything I fancy? Well, I can refuse applications for registration at the moment if they contain insufficient information, and I would certainly consider that to be insufficient information. Uh, later on, from November next year, I can also refuse registrations which might break these principles of good practice. Will you be refusing registrations then, do you think? It depends what I find. <laughs> if all the registrations are acceptable, no, but if some of them are not, then of course I will. Does the Act, in fact, let people do what they like, so long as they actually register that they're going to do that? Yes, it does. In fact, the weakness of the Act, really, is that provided you declare what you're going to do, you can do almost anything you like. The Act also requires computer users to keep personal data secure. But prying eyes can find the weakness in any system. A Riverside pub was the venue for my second meeting with the police computer mole. We've concealed his identity because he's now under investigation by the Police Complaints Authority. He reported on the checks I'd asked him to make, and then explained how easy it was to get information. But even a beat Bobby has immediate access by radio to millions of police computer records. Later he was able to tell me what I'd asked about the personal details and criminal record of Mr. Stephen Boulding of Morden in Surrey. Yes. This is Stephen Boulding, who's got a criminal record for offences connected with animal liberation. 
All the details that my informant had supplied were quite correct, including Stephen's criminal records office, that CRO number. That's information that's only available in police files. Um, yes, well, I've got a, a copy of uh, an extract of my criminal record here, and the, uh, the number does tally, yes. So that would appear to be correct? Yes, that's right. So the mall certainly appeared to be selling accurate police information. The great danger to privacy is that this kind of unauthorised leak is by no means isolated. I've been in practice now privately um, for over 15 years and I've had contact with literally hundreds of private detectives and security consultants and since 1968 that I can recall most of them have had access to official records. Unauthorised of course, but there's authorised leaks too. We have experienced people attempting to gain information from the Inland Revenue. I have been involved in a few, a very few, exchanges of information with other government departments. Um, the Inland Revenue tends to believe that it always gains more than it gives away. But it is prepared to give information away, contrary yes. to pledges of confidentiality. Yes. Tight security is in force at the Police National Computer Complex at Hendon, North London. But steel doors are no protection against an inside job, and neither is the Data Protection Act. It's littered with serious loopholes. Some organisations, like the Police, Inland Revenue and Security Services, are given special dispensation under the Act. They can store information on their computers that's been illegally acquired, or taken from another data bank that had promised to keep personal information private. Entries in the Data Protection Register are supposed to list anyone who has access. But these organisations can dip in for a fishing trip without leaving a record they've been there. So the Act actually requires users to tell lies. Well, that's what it seems to me. And it has been called a fraud on the public for that reason. Do you call it a fraud on the public? I think it is. I think, uh, I think it's most regrettable that an Act of Parliament should encourage people to think that they can use double standards and get away with it in that way. Another problem. The Act says that everyone must uphold the statutory principles of data protection. One of these principles is that personal data held for one purpose will not be used for any incompatible purpose. So what about the electoral register and what private companies do with it without our permission? That's an exemption as well. The Home Office had a look at that for me. For a number of technical and practical reasons, they felt it was not possible to alter the form which you fill in to go on the electoral register and they express disappointment about that. I'm disappointed as well. I'd hope that might be possible. Why can't people be told when they register to vote that the information they give may be sold to commercial computer data banks? Well, in essence, they're told now through publication of Acts of Parliament. It's not been widely publicised other than that way, but it is known and this programme, of course, will help people to know of that. I think it's, it's fairly typical of the Home Office response that having got a Data Protection Act and having got a Data Protection Registrar, they're going to do nothing else to protect our privacy. Personal privacy takes a back seat, essentially. Personal privacy is the last thing that the bureaucrat really thinks about because it's a barrier to efficient administration. All the same, we can't run away from computers. Private or public, they're here to stay. But there's been a great deal of secrecy and a greater lack of candour from government departments. And if you think all this only matters to people with something to hide, think again. You never know if on the records held about you there's something completely inaccurate and completely wrong. Your name's been confused with somebody else's. There's false information about somebody else's criminal record which is actually following you around. And anyway, what business is it of anybody else's to have information about your private life? Let's, let's reverse that. Why should they hold information about you?
This is the annual meeting of one of Britain's smallest trade unions. It's only got 280 members, yet its influence on government policy has been profound. In trade union terms, this man's the shop steward's convener. He's head of the negotiating committee, and the man he negotiates with is a few rows behind. The trade union is the Association of Chief Police Officers, President James Anderton. The man at the back is the Home Secretary, Douglas Hurd. Two years ago, Mr. Hurd's deputy at the Home Office summed up the relationship between the Association and the government. You, the Chief Constable, are not slow to tell us if we are getting it wrong, and that is as it should be. But until the miners' strike in 1984, hardly anyone had ever heard of the Association, ACPO for short. Even now, almost all its deliberations, decisions and documents are secret. Indeed, the full extent of ACPO's influence can only be traced with the help of detective skills, which ACPO members would, in different circumstances, take pride in. The charges against ACPO are that they, not the government, have decided national policy in most fields of law and order, that they're trying to set up a national police force by stealth, and that they are unnecessarily secretive and accountable to no one but themselves. So, how does ACPO plead? We are accountable, I suppose, essentially, to ourselves as a responsible body. Um, if we make uh, serious errors of judgment, uh, then uh, the whole world knows, and we are very quickly criticised, and have been from time to time, um, because um, usually there has been a lack of proper information mm -hmm. about what we were seeking to do, and we may be partly at fault in that. I have a huge post bag and the public in my area are not slow to criticize me and my officers if they think we haven't got it right. You're happy that you're accountable? Well, I'm certainly challenged and I'm certainly prepared to answer to the people for what I do. But can you really be accountable only to a daily post bag of complaints? For the moment, ACPO seems to be pleading guilty. So we set out to find if chief constables like ACPO President Jim Anderton were really prepared to answer to the people for what they and ACPO do. We started by asking for basic clues. What is ACPO? Who runs it? Every trade union must have a rule book. So we asked for a look at ACPOs. I don't think any organization necessarily makes its uh, rules available to all and sundry. Uh, there's nothing um, secret about them as far as I'm concerned. Is it a document you'd be prepared to make available to this program? Uh, well, I wouldn't. I would have to uh, make inquiries of my colleagues, but I don't think it's a document that I have the authority to make available to anybody. A small clue in the charge of secrecy. So like any detective starting a big case, we needed a Chief Constable Supergrass to help us with our inquiries. And we did obtain a copy of the rule book. It's no bestseller, but it's a helpful glimpse under the Association's veil of modesty. Forty-three chief constables are members of the ACPO Council. In Scotland, there's a brother organisation, ACPOS, or ACPO Scotland. The two work closely together. The rules make it clear that ACPO's ruling body, the seven-member executive committee, is virtually self-selecting. The committee themselves usually nominate the president and other members. There's seven permanent council committees on topics of major importance and many other special committees and working parties on issues of the day. Although the association has no statutory existence, it dominates a quasi-official body called the Central Conference of Chief Constables. That's where they meet senior Home Office civil servants twice a year. What's discussed at the conference is secret even from most ACPO members. And the conference fails to represent everyone with a legitimate claim to attend. Well, I think the main criticism to make of that is that the police system of our country is supposed to be based on a tripartite arrangement, that is, local democracy, central democracy, and the professional chief constables. Now, the central conference only involves the senior representatives of the chief constables, not all the chief constables, and senior civil servants and other government representatives. There is no involvement of the third member of the uh, partnership, which is local democracy. Cavalry charges and riot squads are the ugly face of policing, one that most chief constables wouldn't want to see happen for real, any more than anybody else. Although hardly anybody knew it at the time, the battle at Orgreave, which saw some of the most violent scenes in the year-long miners' strike, also saw new policies from ACPO being tested for the first time. 
Rather later, however, the association's plan saw the full light of day. In complete secrecy, ACPO had issued members with a riot control manual laying down new and radical tactics for dealing with this kind of situation. In particular, the manual suggested special uses for shields and truncheons, uses which were at variance with official Home Office policy. But Home Office guidelines were put aside, and ACPO's suggestions prevailed. This is what local police standing orders, based on Home Office guidance, say about the use of truncheons for controlling a crowd. The use of the truncheon is only to be resorted to in extreme cases when all other efforts to arrest have failed and a prisoner is likely to escape. This is part of ACPO's interpretation, as seen at Orgreave in 1984. Run at the crowd in pairs to disperse and or incapacitate. Disperse the crowd and incapacitate missile throwers and bring leaders by striking in a controlled manner with batons. But since the existence of the manual was supposed to be secret at the time, even very senior police officers on the spot knew nothing about it. Well, the riot training manual issued by ACPO is still something of a mystery because I've never met anybody who's seen all of it. And it was quite obvious at the time when it became publicised, I think which just before Orgreave during the miners' strike, that many senior officers hadn't seen it. There was the famous incident of the uh, senior officer rebuking a group of men who were striking their shields with their truncheons. Uh, there was a lot of criticism of this practice in the press. Two or three days later it was revealed that this is a tactic encouraged by the uh, riot control manual to instill fear into the rioters. Unfortunately for ACPO, when some of the people charged with rioting at Orgreave came to court a year later, Police officers were forced to disclose the document from the witness box. Parts of the manual were then deposited in the House of Commons Library. It was and still is a most useful and helpful document. It uh, offers us uh, guidelines and uh, helpful information uh, upon how to deal with outbreaks of serious uh, public uh, disorder. And dispersing and incapacitating is something that you regard as within the minimum use of force? Yes, are we now talking about a subject of public disorder and riot, or are we discussing the role and function of the ACPO? Which well, is it? We're discussing the words used in the riot control manual. Well, I'm not here to discuss the words used in uh, a confidential police document. So ACPO pleads the suspect's right to silence. But did ACPO think of asking anybody else before suggesting that sort of tactic? The Home Office, the courts, and government law officers could all have had an important interest in the public interest. Why should we consult people outside the police service when we're determining operational policies and tactics? You have been to tell it's been received from Mr. Sheeran. This national reporting centre was set up by ACPO at the very beginning of the strike. From the National Control Centre at Scotland Yard, units of every police force in England and Wales were being directed by a single commander, the ACPO president. ACPO called it mutual aid, but the critics said, now we have got a national police force. And when it came to intercepting pickets a long way from the pits they were trying to reach, different forces suddenly adopted the same novel tactics. ACPO certainly seemed to have put a new national policy into force. The individual chief officers would say that that was their decision, that the chief constable of Kent decided that people would be stopped at the Dartford Tunnel. Chief constable of Northamptonshire and Nottinghamshire decided that people would be stopped on the borders they're coming in. But it was a very similar policy pursued by most of the forces taking part. There were no policy directives issued at all from the National Reporting Centre which, as you know, is under the overall control or command, as it were, of the president of the ACPO at that particular moment of time. If there weren't policy directives from ACPO, there certainly was an agreed policy. And what's more, a policy that was, quite simply, an attempt to reshape the existing law. The difficult thing about that is that, pragmatically, it might have been the right decision. It would perhaps prevented a lot of um, disorder and dispute, but there was no law then that allowed the chief officers to do it. 
you think those chief constables who did set up roadblocks so far afield and in so doing led the courts rather than followed them were acting outside the rule of law? It, is not, just it is not for me to comment on the actions of individual chief constables. Uh, you would wish to follow the courts yourself rather than lead them? I don't see the point or relevance of that question in the context of a discussion about the role of the association of chief police officers. So ACPO pleads the right to silence. After months at the centre of the news, police chiefs were well aware of the controversy that the National Reporting Centre had created. So they made a public display of dismantling the NRC when the strike was over. It'll never be put together again, at least not under that name. It's been retitled the Mutual Aid Coordination Centre. But its activities had shown the public how a national police force, or at least a national squad of riot police, would operate. That's the main evidence that suggests that ACPO could become the centre of a British national police force. We may get one, one day. Um, whether it would be better than what we have at the present time is a moot question. Um, if we had a national police force controlled wholly politically by whichever party was in power, then I don't think that would be a terribly good thing. Continental military-style police once seemed very alien to Britain, but this is a British police exercise in Birmingham. Could this be how we'd experience the national police of a future Britain? It's certainly the kind of state police image that many people fear. But the evidence suggests that ACPO is definitely not the prototype for a national police force. Rather, it's the alternative, an alternative that chief constables prefer. Under the present system, ACPO helps chief constables get the best of both worlds, local autonomy and national influence, but without control or accountability, either local or central. I don't think the vast majority of chief constables would want a national police force because I think there is an awareness that a national police force would lead to a greater control of chief officers of police. I mean, they haven't had to put up with a, a bureaucracy which is higher in the pecking order than themselves. But riot control is only one of a large number of sensitive areas of policing policy on which ACPO has developed and maintained a clear corporate position. They include the use of computers, special branch operations, public order, and police intelligence systems. In these matters, the association's views have usually prevailed. Two years ago, as a new public order bill was being debated in Parliament, ACPO moved to a unique new phase of political activity, direct lobbying in the House of Commons. Well, it was so important uh, an issue, it was so fundamental to the whole future of policing in this country that we had to, yes, take a somewhat extraordinary step in making sure that right up to the last minute the views of the police service and especially chief constables was made known. The ACPO lobby was effective in getting what they wanted from the public order bill and in not getting what they didn't want, such as a power to arrest for offences of racial harassment. That was left out. ACPO members have indeed learned how to use political muscle. In his memoirs, former Metropolitan Commissioner Sir Robert Mark boasted how he and ACPO had taken on the government and won. The government had wanted to reform picketing laws, but ACPO didn't like the plan. So from their Scotland Yard offices, ACPO telex to every chief constable, urging them to protest. The success of ACPO in killing that bill was only one example of the chief constable's lobby in action. Oh yes, I mean, from time to time, um, the ACPO office, at the behest of the president, would send out to telex messages to all chief constables, advising them of, say, the ACPO policy or the ACPO line, and asking them not to go against it. So there would be an ACPO party line? Yes, there would be an ACPO party line, which was usually thrashed out at the um, Chief Constable's council meeting. Police Constable Brian Jones is the familiar face of the police. No flame-proof suits, no riot shields, no truncheon rattling. A friendly face on the streets, a face you can talk to, who tell you the time of day or the way to the bus stop. You go down here, you'll see the television shop, DER. Mm -hmm. If you turn left at DER... But coppers like Brian have another job to do, a job that isn't necessarily obvious in situations like this. He's expected not just to use his eyes and ears for anything going on round him, but to feed it all back into central files, acting as the front line of an intelligence system, a system designed by, guess who? Criminal intelligence is material which is um, collected virtually on all and sundry. It's not um, 
information or intelligence dealing with terrorists or subversives. It's um, information which is picked up by local community policemen, area constables, your friendly Bobby, um, about the everyday lives of very ordinary people. Um, police constables are told in, in Lothian and Borders, for example, and other, many other forces throughout the country, to have an informant on every street. Somebody, according to force orders, uh, who is curious enough to uh, find out about other people living down their road and pass that information on to the police. That means not just watching for crime, but assiduously gathering information about people and events and indexing it away. About 12 years ago, ACPO set up a special committee to develop police local intelligence systems. Now, in documents describing the tasks and duties of a community constable, officers like Brian are told to secure the services of at least one informant in every street, make himself known to local officials, anyone who has legitimate access to private houses and premises and is in a position to give information. Cultivate shopkeepers, tradesmen and garage proprietors were always good sources of information. Not this morning. I've never used the phrase an informant in every street, but if there was somebody in every street who was uh, concerned enough um, to keep a, a, an eye out for anything that he believes is wrong or hears is wrong, then I'd be very glad if he would tell us all about it. I, mean, I have, uh, there were some uh, crime intelligence sheets found on a rubbish dump in, uh, in Craig Miller in Edinburgh. And the information there includes comments like uh, such and such young girl, 16 years old, is, is, is stopped in the street. She has got uh, shocking pink hair and is three months pregnant. Full stop. End of story. Uh, there are other comments. Did it say she was a criminal or suspected no, no, of crime? No, 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 no. Uh, I analysed these reports and um, found the, the number of people who are stopped and checked in, uh, enormous. But the hit rate, the, the arrests that come, uh, are minimal. You can make what you will of the collection of intelligence and you can make it sound like some horrendous 1984 situation. It is nothing like that. And we are asking everybody, as the Anglo-Saxons did in feudal days, to look after each other, uh, to watch what is happening, asking people, if they can, to provide the police with useful information in the bid to bring down and to reduce the extent of crime. The people who've what can possibly be wrong with that as a fundamental human, common community practice? Nothing. While doing an official study with the police, Richard Kinsey estimated that 60% of those whose police intelligence files he saw had no criminal conviction. These people could include the relations of criminals, innocent witnesses, suspects, even victims of crime. So what sort of information do the association's guidelines suggest that police should keep? Well, that is a matter for us, isn't it? What sort of sources should they seek information from, according to the guidelines? Um, is this a program about the ACPO or about criminal intelligence? I'm sorry. It's about the guidelines. The ACPO guidelines. I phrased my question in that way to refer to the guidelines. How we collect and uh, collate and analyse intelligence is a matter for chief constables. It's not a matter for public discussion. So ACPO claims the right to silence, again. So who does control policing policy in such sensitive matters as intelligence files? Especially now the files are going onto computers. Local intelligence systems have become absolutely standard throughout Britain. ACPO's reports and guidelines, adapted to suit by individual forces, tell police officers what to look for and what to file away. At the national level, a central police computer has been established in Hendon, North London. Because of the usual policing sensitivities, it's called the Police National Computer, not the National Police Computer. The PNC is linked to police headquarters all over Britain, and from there by radio to every police officer on patrol, like PC 3092, Eddie Henderson, on the Newcastle Beat. M12B from Tango 3092. Tango 3092, go ahead. A vehicle check, please. 3092, can you go ahead, VRM, please? It's Charlie 91. The system means that a vehicle check to see what the national computer knows about it can be obtained by members of any police force in Britain. 
The police national computer came into operation 13 years ago and is now used 32 million times a year. Under the guidance of its technical and crime committees, ACPO supervised almost all recent police computer innovations. They found that many major investigations, like the search for the Yorkshire Ripper, got badly bogged down in laborious paperwork. Key pieces of information remained buried in endless filing cabinets full of index cards. In replacing the cabinets with computers, ACPO, not the Home Office, was firmly in the lead. In a series of regular ACPO reviews of the police use of computers, the Home Office's only role is to be thanked for doing the typing. Police special branch officers have to protect senior government ministers when they're in public. But the majority of special branch officers work well away from public view, gathering intelligence and potential threats to public order. That's very political and consequently very sensitive work. But ACPO, not the Home Office, wrote the guidelines specifying special branch duties. Fourteen years after that, a House of Commons Select Committee decided to look at the special branch. Only then did the Home Office issue their own guidelines, for the very first time. So what happens under this system if ACPO says one thing and the Home Office wants something different? Can the Home Office just say no? We've already seen that in the heat of battle at Orgreave, it was ACPO's guidelines that operated, even though they were different to Home Office policy at the time. Of course, the association doesn't always get its own way over things like cash and staffing and resources. But if the Home Office wanted to impose a policy on Britain's police chiefs that they didn't want? I feel that if 43 chief constables won't do or don't want to do what the Home Office uh, want them to do, the chief constables will win. So as a body, you are at liberty within the law to go off in your own direction, ignoring what the Home Office says? Well, when you say ignoring what the Home Office says, I think that's putting it rather strongly. Um, clearly, we have to do what we believe is right in any given set of circumstances. If ACPO wished to, to be opposed to a central government, it would be able to do so up to a very high point, I think. I think you would need a change in the law to alter that. Now, having reached the giddy heights of ACPO membership, and that means above the rank of Chief Superintendent, how do you make it to the very top of the association itself? Not for this trade union, the uncertainties of secret ballots and elections. In practice, what actually happens is that the policy committee would select who they think should be the next president of ACPO. And you get the situation where at their annual conference this uh, selection is put before the audience and they're invited to um, accept him. It's a matter for the annual general meeting of our association whether or not they are prepared to endorse a year's vice president as the president the following year when the time comes. Invariably that is done. I can't imagine, for instance, that when they were told that Jim Anderton was going to be the vice president, uh, they were asked, does anybody want to vote against him? Mr. Anderton was elected this morning as the president of this association by his fellow members without any demur or issue or otherwise. Does anyone ever say no to the existing hierarchy of ACPO appointing their successors? Uh, not up to now. And I cannot think of a very good reason why they should. I have been told that on one occasion in the last decade, uh, when the name of the future president was announced, it was gr greeted with a, uh, a roar of, or a groan of disapproval. But nobody actually got up and said they objected to him, and that man went on to become president of that the, 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 the organization tends to be dominated by the strong personalities and uh, people who who take a special interest in the you know, I call the power structure of ACPO uh, a number of chief constables are just content to be uh, running their police forces and not to take too much of a leading part in national affairs so it tends to be a kind of self-selecting hierarchy it is self-selecting there are five people who select a friend somebody in whom they've got confidence and the rest of the body has no practical say in who that person is. Who am I to serve? Am I to At local level, however, chief constables can and do speak their minds to local police authorities. Officially, the chief constable answers to the authority, but it's not always clear who's telling who what to do. I serve the people who are being beaten, and this committee does too, and don't forget it.
Open war between police authorities and police chiefs isn't unusual these days. Chief constables have a degree of autonomy that can arouse fierce criticism. One such incident provoked the head of the Manchester Police Authority to comment. We seem to operate on the principle of the infallibility of chief constables. We consult them, we listen to them, but at the end of the day, someone has got to make a decision and be finally accountable in law. And who better than a chief constable? If he wants to challenge his police authority, the chances are that he will win both the support of the Home Secretary and, if necessary, as has happened quite recently, he can go to the uh, appeals court and get uh, his police authority overruled. The actual policy of how you police your community will vary from community to community and priority to priority. It may be that the burghers of Bromley are more concerned about burglary uh, than those in Islington who are more concerned about parking on the sidewalks and children being killed in the traffic. And all of these problems are, are really local problems which have to be handled by the local authority, just like any other. It's a question of, I mean, we know, for example, that the, 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 the police can't enforce every law in the book. It's impossible. They make choices. Now, it's important that those choices are in line with what local populations, local communities want. I think at the present time, nobody quite understands the nature uh, of the power, or the potential power, of ACPO in the political sense. I mean, ACPO hasn't got a constitutional position. It isn't even mentioned in legislation. And uh, perhaps the time has come when it should be. To have a politically directed police force even if determined by a democratic process, I personally feel that that would not be in the best public interest. If it was decreed that that is how it should be, then I have no grounds upon which to object. But I think I would then be living in a country that was not my country. And so I would have to review my whole position, professionally and personally, very critically indeed. I might have to campaign against such a system. To you, then, does democracy mean political control? Um, are we talking about James Anderton, the Democrat or anti-Democrat, or are we discussing the affairs of the ACPO? So what are the verdicts on our original charges against ACPO? Not guilty to trying to set up a national police force. Having undue influence on government policy. Well, the evidence is there, but perhaps politicians too should be in the dock for neglecting their duty. And ACPO plead guilty to the charge of being accountable to no one but themselves. The charge of being unnecessarily secretive? Well, you can be the judge of that. satellite will soon be going into space. The new British spy satellite has been a bigger secret than the nuclear program. Until today, only a few people have been allowed to know its special code name, Zircon. The 
huge cost of Project Zircon flouts an important agreement with Parliament, so intelligence chiefs have had to devise a cover story. They're hoping that when it's out in space, no one will notice what Zircon really is. These British communication satellites, now being assembled, are critical to the cover story. Launch enough communication satellites, they hope, and an extra one may slip through unnoticed. But they've already blown their own cover story two years ago. And since Zircon's a SIGINT satellite, a spy satellite that listens, any hostile intelligence agency that wants to know will know in a matter of hours what Zircon really is. Oh, yes, I think everybody knows where everybody's satellite is, and you can see lists which are you know, published in defence journals, etc., of who has launched what, where, what its orbit is. Uh, you know, and I think you can probably do this using school children in uh, Milton Keynes or somewhere or other these days. But SIGINT satellites are very, very expensive. British intelligence simply can't afford a price tag like that on its own. So the bill for Zirkin has been secretly passed over here to the Ministry of Defence. I've been told by those who've worked here that Zirkin will cost about 5% of what the Trident nuclear program is costing. That's between 400 and 500 million pounds. So Zirkin's been Whitehall's most closely guarded secret for the past five years. But the need to make defence cuts to accommodate it has meant that rather more civil servants have come to know about Zirkin than spy bosses would have liked. And then there's the special reason for secrecy about Zirkin. The plan for Project Zirkin is a flagrant breach of a promise to Parliament by the Ministry of Defence. They said they'd never again deceive its Public Accounts Committee about expenditure on big projects costing hundreds of millions of pounds, no matter how secret they were. I mean, the whole purpose of the setting up of the Public Accounts Committee in the last century was to make sure that when Parliament votes money, it votes it for specific projects and we ensure that the money that is raised by government is used for those purposes and is given to the right sort of people, the people that uh, can handle that kind of money. And our job is to check that this is done. Can there be any exceptions to that kind of rule? Not in general, no. Because once you make an exception, <laughs> then of course leakages can occur in all sorts of ways, and the basic discipline of public expenditure starts to be eroded, and once that happens, then you've no control at all. Spy satellites are naturally a sensitive subject, not one about which many people can talk easily. People will say a great deal more off the record than they can say publicly. But a number of senior formal officials agreed to talk to us on the record about the new importance to Britain of spying from space. Now over the last uh, 10, perhaps 12 years, uh, there has of course been a quite fundamental shift uh, in the balance of which sensors, which capabilities you look to. We get increasingly, as you know, a massive amount uh, of intelligence uh, from space. How could it be otherwise? Because the problems we face as an open society is to derive information on intents and our capabilities of a very close society. Uh, we're looking, of course, increasingly at the ability to intercept the electronic signals, and increasingly to handle, again, that massive amount of data, confidently handle uh, that information by advanced signal and data processing techniques. The Zircon satellite should dramatically change Britain's international intelligence situation. In the Falcons, we had to rely on American uh, satellite information. But if it is, as I say, if the government wishes it to be what it is said to be, then you will have to have all the appurtenances of, 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 of a, a general and overall strategic system of which SIGINT and satellite information is very important. Are you saying that Britain and NATO effectively depend entirely on the United States for that information? For that, uh, for that uh, strategic intelligence, Mr. Campbell, the dependence is total. What difference to the situation for Britain and NATO will be made by the Zircon satellite? I can't talk to you about that, I'm afraid. You're saying that everything about Zirkin is, is, is classified. Yes, I'm sorry about that. So why is Britain getting a spy satellite of its own? 
Well, you tell me it is. I don't know that it's getting a spy satellite, but I'm delighted if it is. I mean, I, uh, I think it's a very important thing that it should have a spy satellite. But, I mean, I think Britain ought to have more satellites of its own. I think, technically, we are really very good at this now. We've been, I think, quite successful industrially in producing effective satellites. Uh, and um, I think it's, it's a growth area in terms of industry as well as in terms, hopefully, uh, of intelligence. British industry tried to enter the space spy race early. At first, the Blue Streak rocket worked well. But eventually, development of a British launcher system was abandoned. After that, new satellites could only go up on other countries' rockets. Implausible cover stories for spy satellites were just as much the fashion then. The United States took the lead by stuffing monkey after monkey into space capsules for so-called biological experiments. Uncle Sam's monkeys in space did distract attention from what was really going into orbit. In order to cover the program, in order to make it invisible, hopefully, to the public and the Soviet Union, they created a cover story. And the public version of this program was that it was called Discover, and that it was a biomedical satellite. So what were the Discover the satellites, really? Really, they were satellites known by the, code, the classified codename Corona, and they were photographic reconnaissance satellites. It's now easy to float spy satellites into orbit from the space shuttle. Rolling out into space, however, Zirkin won't be getting out a camera. It's a listening, not a looking satellite, with a name as bizarre as its purpose. That's Signals Intelligence, or SIGINT. Well, basically, the Signal Intelligence satellites are capable of intercepting a wide variety of communications, uh, radar emanations, telemetry from missile tests, and basically any type of radio broadcast that's actually broadcast. Uh, they're not capable of picking up, for instance, telephone communications along cables, but just about anything that is broadcast, uh, even a walkie-talkie, can be intercepted by these signal intelligence satellites. SIGINT satellites are super-sensitive systems. The information received by these satellites is relayed to ground link stations, like Menwith Hill in Yorkshire. So they're rather secretive places, too. Uh, we've got one of our gentlemen coming up to see you. Would you like to hang on until he arrives? It'll only be a few minutes. Ministry of Defence police patrols continuously circle the outskirts of the base, keeping watch for suspicious passers-by. Obviously, as probably my officers have informed you, we can't stop you from uh, filming Menwith Hill Station from the road. Menwith Hill Station is the largest centre of the United States National Security Agency outside America itself. The base continuously monitors communications from Europe and the USSR. But in 1975, Menwith Hill was given vital new tasks, the control of the latest generation of American electronic spy satellites. Each of these tracking dishes is linked to a single satellite in space hovering over the Soviet Union. Each of the white golf balls, called radomes, also conceals a tracking dish linked to the very newest spy satellites. We have main engine start for Three, two, one, ignition, and liftoff. Liftoff of Discovery, the first flight, totally dedicated to Department of Defense mission. This is the launch of the Space Shuttle in January 1985, carrying on board America's latest and biggest ever electronic listening satellite. It's codenamed Magnum, and now hovers over the Indian Ocean, looking, or rather listening, down on Russia. One of these radomes is probably Magnum's link to the ground. How does a listening satellite work? The satellite is out in space, 24,000 miles above the Earth's surface, hovering, listening in. But while the ears are out in space, the brain is on the ground. The satellite's targets are selected and controlled by the listeners and their computers. Whatever's picked up is sent back to them by a radio beam from the satellite.
A key feature of SIGINT satellites like Zircon or Magnum are their gigantic umbrella-like dishes, which they use to scoop up other countries' radio signals. Each listening satellite can look down on a quarter of the Earth's surface, sifting out valuable signals from the rubbish that's around it. It can focus on half a continent or just a single building. The Soviet Union already knows all about what Western SIGINT satellites can do. British civil servant Geoffrey Plyme was convicted of spying five years ago. He worked here, government communications headquarters in Cheltenham, GCHQ, using American spy satellite information. It's GCHQ, not the Ministry of Defence, who is the real customer for the new Zircon satellite. Cheltenham is the British headquarters of SIGINT. Only ten years ago, the very word SIGINT was classified secret. The name GCHQ could only be whispered. Its special intelligence relationship with the US National Security Agency was another secret. But that's all changed. The government decision to order trades unions disbanded has made GCHQ staff the unexpected champions of trades unionism. And GCHQ itself, the most famous electronic intelligence agency in the world. The American end of the SIGINT special relationship is the United States National Security Agency with headquarters at Fort Meade near Washington. This is the center to which both Men With Hill and GCHQ ultimately report. Inside these offices, they know that the GCHQ spy, Jeffrey Prime, had clearances to see the most secret of American satellite intelligence and that he gave it away. Well, I'm quite certain, Mr. Campbell, that there are corners of Washington who certainly do not trust us. And I'm equally certain that that doesn't uh, actually flavor, in any significant way, the genuine exchange between the United States and the United Kingdom. The Americans really do look to us, uh, the particular capability that is in Cheltenham, they do look to us uh, as uh, very shrewd second centers of independence, of a decision, of analysis, and so on and so forth. Clearly, there's great, great asymmetry between us as far as hardware is concerned. Nevertheless, that asymmetry, the discrepancy between what the two countries' intelligence agencies should gather from the air or from space, has for many years bothered GCHQ. According to Sir Frank Cooper, they first wanted their own intelligence satellite in the early 1970s, but the government of the day turned them down. Finally, however, in the summer of 1983, they got what they wanted. But SIGINT satellites don't come cheaply it would cost a large slice of the British intelligence budget. Just how large? Very large indeed. Um, I mean, that, that, that would take up, it couldn't possibly be spent in one year out of GCHQ's budget. And uh, even if it was spread over a long period of time, it would be a huge proportion of their budget in terms of the available money. So the money for Zircon, like the money for many other secret projects, is hidden away, laundered inside the defense budget and spread over many years. But concealing the money being spent is one thing. How do you conceal five tons of high technology hardware once you've launched it into space, where everybody can see it? The answer is either one, you don't say, or two, you pretend it's something else. And only one answer would work for Britain. For the British who have only the Skynet satellites in geosynchronous orbit, uh, to launch a satellite and not specify what its function is, is the same as saying that it's an intelligence satellite. So they would have to come up with some cover that would explain it as a communication satellite or some other satellite that, that the British have. And since there's only Skynet, they would have to try to disguise it as Skynet. Skynet, Britain's military communication satellite system, is no secret. Manufacturers British Aerospace will happily send you car stickers and colorful wall posters all about it. We were able to film some Skynet satellites being assembled last year. The second of two new Skynet Mark IV satellites seen under construction was originally due to be launched last month. Accompanying them would have been two of these men. They included Army, Navy and Air Force candidates lining up to be the first Britons in space. On the 3rd of May 1985, the RAF celebrated the news that their man, squadron leader Nigel Wood, would be the first British astronaut. A Navy commander would follow, but the Army's man was left on the ground. 
Then, just four days later, this announcement from British Aerospace said there was to be a third satellite in the Skynet series. So why on earth hadn't the Ministry announced the good news? A third satellite should have meant a third astronaut, and given the Army its place in space. Had the satellite buying section of the Ministry really not told the satellite launching section that there were three Skynet satellites to go up, not two? Which wasn't the only odd thing about British Aerospace's sudden announcement of a third satellite. The announcement said that the new satellite was due to be launched in 1988 and be positioned 53 degrees east as part of the growing constellation of UK satellites. Now wait a minute. 53 degrees east is right on the Soviet Union. That's where Magnum is parked, an ideal spot for the listening satellite. But the other Skynet satellites are going up over the Atlantic, the only place covering all Britain's NATO allies. There seems to be something rather odd about the way in which this whole announcement has been used, and it's in a very odd position if it is a communication satellite. A former senior civil servant, Clive Ponting's a past master at the art of writing official announcements that try very hard not to say what's really happening. It doesn't actually say that it's part of the Skynet system. I mean, it seems to be going up as uh, later, two years later, um, and simply as another satellite, um, but not necessarily part of the Skynet system. The announcement attracted press interest. Space writer Martin Inns questioned the Ministry about some of the unusual aspects of the new Satellite in the Skynet series. I rang them to ask what they needed a satellite there for, and they told me it was because of the large British military presence in Hong Kong. Not only would it be militarily useful, but it would save them a lot of money on telephone calls between Britain and Hong Kong. Were they surprised that you had rung them up? Yes, they were, because the position of the satellite was not supposed to be known to me. I pointed out that I'd read it in a British Aerospace press release, and at that stage they told me that British Aerospace shouldn't have published that, and if the press release had been properly approved, they wouldn't have had that fact in it. So that the position of the satellite, they said, was supposed to have been a secret? It's supposed to be, but British Aerospace had let it out of the bag just through incompetence or mismanagement. Just two weeks later, another press release was published by the Society of British Aerospace Companies. Their press release had apparently been changed at the last minute to exclude the unwanted reference to the secret position of the new satellite. Telltale extra spaces showed that the original release had been altered. The information concealed below the new typing was that position at 53 degrees east. That was the information that British Aerospace had not been supposed to give out in the first place. The whole Skynet system was supposed to be for use over the Atlantic. There had been no previous mention in any of the literature of the need for this link to the Far East. So yes, it was a surprise at that stage. Completely new requirement. Oh yes, which hadn't been mentioned in any of the previous Skynet literature at all. What happened the next time you rang up the Defence Ministry about the third Skynet satellite? On that occasion, I was told that the military mission for which it had been ordered was secret and not a matter that they were willing to discuss with me. And what do you think the secrecy might be about? About what the Skynet satellite itself is for over the Indian Ocean, because um, there still isn't, in fact, a, a, a plausible story as to what it's going to be for. There's other unusual features of the satellite that Britain is putting up in this special position. For example, every satellite that's launched has to have its own ground link station and its own tracking dish, which points at it continuously, sending and receiving the information relayed from space. Well, RAF Oak Hanger in Hampshire is the ground terminal for the new Skynet communication system. Earlier this year, the major electronics company Plessy installed this multi-million pound tracking and control centre for the new satellites. But they've only installed these two tracking dishes, not three, as the company admit would be required for the three satellite communication system. So where's the third tracking dish? We asked Plessy this question. They told us that they were not allowed to answer it and that our inquiries would have to be referred to the Ministry of Defence. And the Ministry wouldn't answer the question either. But there's no shortage of satellite tracking dishes at Government Communications Headquarters in Cheltenham. Challenger, go and throttle up. The Space Shuttle should have launched both Skynet satellites by now. The disaster's changed all that. There's no doubt as to when any satellite can go up or what launcher it can use. The Zircon satellite needs a cover story, which would have to be about Skynet. And there's a special Satellite in the Skynet series to be launched into a very odd position. All the clues point to one conclusion. This special satellite is going to be Zircon, Britain's first ever spy satellite. 
and no doubt the Russians will be coming to the same conclusion. Well, they can judge from locating its position, where it is, whether it is in fact possibly communications or not. They can monitor signals going in and out of the satellite and judge from uh, the various patterns whether or not it's a SIGINT SIGIN satellite or a communication satellite. Well, it's the difference between a satellite that would be the size perhaps of a car and a, satell and a satellite that on radar would seem to be the size of a medium-sized building. So the difference between the two is readily detectable on radar. And if there is a deficient amount of traffic or no traffic at all, they will conclude that it's not a um, communication satellite, that it's more likely to be a listening satellite listening to them. Soviet defense officials' awareness of the capabilities of Western SIGINT satellites was demonstrated when the KAL Korean airliner Flight 007 was shot down. Marshal Ugarkov appeared in front of maps displaying the exact tracks of U.S. signal intelligence satellites called ferrets. Well, the Soviets have a somewhat easier time of figuring out what these satellites are than we do because they have their own technical collection facilities. Would the general purpose of such a satellite be apparent? Well, you obviously can tell something about it, um, you know, what its orbit is, uh, whether it's stationary or not. Um, you know, and it was obviously a fair uh, advice. You learn more about it as, you know, is the orbit being changed or is it not being changed? And what you won't know uh, is, is exactly what is on board and what its uh, technical capability is. Senior defense officials to whom I've spoken say that that technical capability will be superb. Obviously, we can't broadcast the exact technical details of what the satellite's targets are going to be. But Zirkin isn't altogether British. Although it's been put together by two British companies, much of its advanced intelligence technology is coming, I've been told, from this corporation, TRW, with offices here near Washington and in California. It's TRW who have manufactured three generations of advanced SIGINT satellites for the U.S. National Security Agency. So why is Britain buying their know-how? There's fears that the U.S. intelligence community takes advantage of its complete monopoly in space intelligence. Well, certainly you do have a situation where, given the fact that the United States has the ability to collect information that other countries are unable to collect, that selective dissemination of that information by the United States or selective interpretation of that information by the United States allows the American government to put a political spin or twist on certain events that uh, allied governments simply are not in a position to question because they don't have an independent source of information. Why would Britain want a spy satellite of its own? Oh, I think for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, first of all, I think uh, there's a degree of what we might call macro and macro politics in it. It would give us a national capability. So that we knew uh, what was going on in an independent way. It also, I think, does give us a standing in our relation, particularly, for example, with the United States. I think the Americans historically have always said, you know, you put your money on the table, you know, and, and you get something out of our, uh, uh, our shop. But if you don't put your money on the table, you know, you don't get as much. But what's Britain putting money on the table for? Will the intelligence obtained be worth the huge amount of money needed? Secrecy makes it hard to tell. Well, of course, one of the uh, real advantages of having these super sensitive programs that the government has, can't discuss, so it says, is that, uh, among other people who can't get a look at them, are legislatures. Uh, the money is buried in the budget somewhere, because, but because it is so highly classified, the legislature really is not able to get a look at that budget and raise questions about whether the money is being wisely spent. In Britain, the Parliamentary Public Accounts Committee are supposed to check how money is being spent. In 1981, they were outraged to discover that the Defence Ministry had secretly spent a billion pounds on modernising Polaris nuclear missiles. The Ministry had to promise that they'd never do that again but they wanted to keep quiet about Zirkin, so ministry officials planned how to get round the promise. But how can nearly half a billion pounds be lost in the defence budget? I mean, it would be a matter, of, no doubt, of clearing it with the controller and auditor general. And I suppose they would have to get his agreement not to tell the politicians on the Public Accounts Committee. Well, I think one would have to be very careful about if you've come to an arrangement with the PAC, 
uh, having, uh, you know, betraying that arrangement in, in, in one way or another. Uh, so, uh, and I don't know how much change, if any, there's been in the past few years. But I mean, certainly my own view would have been, if I had come to an arrangement with the Public Accounts Committee, that one would have stuck to it. And Parliament thinks exactly the same. Only last year, the committee emphatically warned Whitehall that they reaffirmed the importance they attached to keeping Parliament reliably informed about the major projects list. Are the Ministry of Defence allowed to leave anything at all off the list? No, no, we make sure that everything is on that list. And I, uh, through repeated assertions, make sure that, that is so. And you've been quite certain that that message has got through? Mm, indeed I have. But at the moment, the Zircon satellite is not something that's yet been officially notified to you? It's not a, one of the major projects at, the, at this uh, moment, as I, as I can recall it. If our information is right, would that be a breach of the rules that the Ministry of Defence had agreed to abide by? Certainly we would expect any project over £250 million to be brought to our notice. So if our evidence is correct, the Ministry of Defence may have breached its own agreement? Well, I would like to go into that uh, rather more fully. Certainly, uh, I stand by the whole purpose of the major project statement that anything costing more than £250 million over its life would be brought to our committee. And if this hasn't been done, obviously this would be a most serious matter. What do you think you would do if you find an investigation that our... I wouldn't so like to deal with a hypothetical question. This is a matter to which I would uh, give uh, very serious consideration indeed in view of the assurances that we've been given in the past. Were these assurances given firmly? I certainly took them to be firm. And honourably? Certainly. Sir Frank Cooper made his agreement with the Public Accounts Committee in 1982, but left office the same year. The very next year, the agreement was broken, and half a billion pounds is now to be siphoned out of the defence budget, with Parliament completely in the dark. But it's Parliament, not officials, which makes the rules and the laws. And as the Public Accounts Committee said, full accountability to Parliament is imperative. <laughs>